Alright. Alright, welcome to the uh, <coughs> Barrington Planning Board meeting of October 19th, 6.30. Uh, present tonight, uh, I'm Jeff Rand, Vice Chair, who's acting chair tonight, as uh, James Jennison is not present. Uh, we have here uh, Ron Allard. We have uh, welcome the new full time member, Andrew Melanikis. Uh, Buddy Hackett is here. We have uh, Andrew Knapp, ex officio member, as well as uh, Barbara Irvine, our administrative assistant in the land use and plant office, and uh, John Huckins, our uh, Code enforcement officer. And we have uh, Steve Diamond uh, also participating remotely due to COVID 19 concerns. So we'll start off the, the meeting here with the uh, first order of business is the approval of the October 5th meeting minutes. Does anyone on the board have any comments on the minutes? Hearing none, do I hear a motion to approve the minutes? Motion to approve. Second. All right, we have a motion by uh, Andrew Malnekis and second by Juan Allard to approve the minutes. The Tuesday, October 5th, 2021 meeting. Take a call. So, <coughs> uh, <coughs> am I? Ron Allard. Allard, I. Andrew Knapp. Knapp, I. Steve Diamond. Diamond, I. And I. So, it's unanimous the meeting minutes as we Okay, I want to switch things around here because we have folks that uh, had applied for the building permit for the select board and passes on item three on the agenda. It's a request for a building permit, Bunzi Point Road, private road by Rand and Darby Bill Wagon. And uh, everybody saw. The so they're they're applying for a building permit to build a home spot here. Is the spot 13 Lindsay Point and Darren. This has been uh, almost three acres of lot. They have notified Butters, and this has been reviewed by both the fire chief and the roadie. Does everybody had an opportunity with uh, Chief Walker and uh, Mark Rowe. Uh, Andy, sorry. You, you. Um, I, I was abreast of them. Or I had talked with both of both the uh, chief and the state agent. Okay. Uh, obviously, this is one of those in which the state requires planning board to be consulted by the select board. Does anybody have any questions, comments about this? The only comment that I had is um, uh, I also live on this road, and Wednesday had provided me with a document that shows that it's a 20 foot driveway, a, um, a driveway easement and placeholder issued for this lot. So there, the easement exists to 
wide in the driveway. Fire chief continued. Right, but the driveway was already, the driveway permit was issued for the lot when the road was expanded in 2014. Was what I, yeah, it's a private road, but there was a driveway permit that was cut for that road previously. Okay. Um, but they still have to go get the selectman authorization before a permit could be issued. So is it the intent to drive not the driveway that was the issue he wanted the road upgrade okay. agent, which was different than the driveway. The fire chief and the road agents knows all about the road, not the driveway. Okay. So the road is has has everyone seen the road? There used to I've be seen, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, there used to be I've trees driven by down both sides of it. Yeah, and it's it's been pretty well opened up. I mean, it's it's one of the better roads that leads down to the water. Best way of putting it. Yeah. A lot but right now, uh, according to the road agent, the current gravel surface is 15 feet. And the fire chief would like it to be 20. Right. So, We want to support the fire chief is obviously select board's going to make a decision but we want to support the widening make a statement that uh, i mean i don't know of any reason does anybody know of any reason why the permit shouldn't be granted just as a no matter other than the road issue but, um, that road well, and he said there's a 24. It, well, no, that's not what I said. I said that I said the road was was widened and expanded. The what they'd be looking at is because they'll be the first lot in on the left hand side. It would end up all coming off of that side of the road because by right you can't take someone else's land on the other side. And if you look at the fire chief's thing, he's an alternative that they can accept instead of making the world wider. Right. Because, oh, what, what? The fire code hasn't changed, but the fire marshal has. So there's a different interpretation in what the uh, emergency lane. Okay. Well, this isn't this isn't uh, the, the meeting is public, but this isn't something we have to have a public hearing on because this is consult and select board. To the, so at this point, I believe we have the still wagons here. Correct? Maybe they can tell us what what their thoughts are with regard to the the, the fire chief. Wanting the road to be widening <coughs> down to your driveway. Can you come up to the table, please? Yeah. So we can hear you. Uh, state your name and still wagon. Okay. Um, it's my wife, Darlene. Just my, my concern is that there's not a lot of clarity uh, from all the discussions I've had with beneficiaries and <coughs> what's actually on the website. Sites like the shoulder. Um, and that's kind of what I understood when I purchased a piece of land. Widening it, I think the road's more like 14 feet, widening it a couple of additional feet, you know, it's, it's not an issue. Uh, but I get concerned with it, we have to fight somebody in the community, one of the neighbors would have an issue with it, and then I would be into other issues to be able to build a, a property that I had good reason to believe was buildable when I purchased it. So, you know, if if we go by what the website says and go with what has historically been the requirement, which is 16 feet with two foot shoulders, it's of little consequence to me. I have to go to 20 feet with two foot shoulders. The easement is only for a three and a half feet. I just don't know if I get into other issues, right? Like, you know, surveying some other legal things I haven't considered at this point. And I just, Go there and start excavating. 
not expect to have some potential have some problems. So I certainly would like to what the current town website says, 16 feet with two foot shoulders. I think that's Well, understood that I would promise to be. Well, if you're going to go to the 19th, that'd be a big problem. For the 19th, yeah, that'll get you two foot shoulders, 23 feet. I mean, I'd like to go with what I've said. I'm 16 feet shoulders. There is a um, fire that comes out in the air. Um, that'll have to be moved. Ask a question. Um, when was that uh, 16 feet established? I don't know. It's, it's on that was part of the geometric designs for low volume roads. That was done probably about 15 years ago. I was on the committee when it was done. Um, okay. It's actually part of a selectman policy. It's the selectman standard for this, so it's actually not a planning board thing. It's a select board thing. Okay. Um, and <coughs> there's actually there's some subdivisions in some of the other local communities that have um, wanted their small dead end roads to be small like that to create less impact and have less impact when stuff's done. So this new interpretation of what it is as a filing is in complete conflict to what the town's regulations are. That's part of what the selectmen have to address when they got their own regulations that state what we accept. And now they got something coming from the fire chief that says that's not good enough. So um, I guess those regulations might change or whatever. The selectmen have to address that. The reason I'm asking is. Do we know why he wants to I can I can the guess the, why he wants New Hampshire fire code. Fire code. Okay. So that geometric design for low volume roads, yes, 20 foot path. So the interpretation before and it's been in, in place for like almost 20 years now was that a 16 foot travel way with two foot shoulders gives you that 20 feet. So and that's how it's been applied and looked at. But with the fire marshal that's in place now, his interpretation is it's supposed to be a 20 foot travel way. Which is, so that's what's wider, and that's why it hasn't been. This issue hasn't come up in the old. This any of the other private buildings that we've done before this. I mean, we've actually had some that come in with the right of ways where only like 16 foot wide and almost a 12 and a half foot path with a couple. Of like one foot shoulders, and those actually got those and that's more approved. But now there's a different political issue going on. Yes, is part to besides the fact that it's written 20 feet. I guess as part of his process, but I can't speak to this. Is 15 years ago, the truck was speaking to now, and a lot of his thought process is access. Uh, truck, the vehicles are bigger, you're going to have more vehicles on site. It's getting probably close to that. It was because of getting emergency services in is the whole reason for that fire code thing. Being yeah. Yeah. That. The access to the park. Yes. Is a is an is a person who is a resident of this road and farther down on it. Yeah. I can tell you the upper section is substantially wider than the lower section. OK, you can pass two vehicles down this section of road. It does require that. They will have to drive on the lawn a little bit yeah. for both of them, but you can get two vehicles past each other down through that. So and, many, and as a person who lives there with a five-year-old, yeah. I don't want high volume speed on a road like that because I have a little boy who goes up and down that road. And it, I bought there with the intent that that road is a small, low volume road that people don't drive like lunatics on. Well, how many, how many, Lots slash homes are there on that? This is the Digital only road. one that is not developed. But how many are there? Is there, uh, is, is there more than four? 13 in total. Okay. It's a camp road dating back to the 1920s. Okay, so if we go back into the road design standards, which are contained in the subdivision, 
regulations for a private minor access less than 200 trips per day. One, it says maximum dwelling units are dead end. Probably when that requirement went into place, you know, all these places were there to begin with. Um, but that specifies, it says pavement width 20 feet. Obviously, this isn't paved, but uh, that probably existed before the paving requirement. However, if I go back to the road design standards, it does say minimum pavement width for local access roads is 20 feet. This width is to feet only the average daily traffic. Below 100, that do not have any truck traffic. That's in 12.2.1. Uh, so there's already an allowance for lower private access that doesn't have truck traffic, which so that already said. There is an allowance here already. It says 18 feet. Well, long traffic. I mean, what does it say? What does it say 16, though? So the 16 is in the class 6 and private road improvement policy, and it's based on the subdivision standards, but it's separate. So the, that's where the 16 foot feet. So to expand on what John alluded to, the, the fire chief is the Implementing the fire code local uh, select board, the planning board doesn't have the authority to waive the fire code. And so the fact that Barrington's current class six drive private road agreement is inconsistent with the fire code in the fire marshal's office is irrelevant because the town can't do anything about the environmental and fire aspects. So the fire team and I have worked uh, to hash out all of the um, implications of this interpretation options that exist because as you know there are a lot of roads that exist in Barrington that don't have paved part of the road. So there's a few options available to, to property owners that can meet the interpretation of fire code that has a 24 and one of those is a waiver through the fire marshal's office for that provision of that which would you know cite reasons for such a waiver in the future. The Fire code, the, the fire marshal's office is also extends to the fire chief the ability to consider all the suitable alternatives to fire. So previously, the, the fire chief was um, you know, offered to, to as an option to property owners to put in a residential sprinkler system in lieu of a 20 foot uh, fire access prior to, to this interpretation. So the fire code is very clear that the fire chief did not. The fire marshal's office um, is delegated to an interpretation of the fire code. The ability for the fire chief to accept at his level without a waiver from the fire marshal's office an alternative that's presented by a property owner, that, uh, whether it's a residential sprinkler system or other suitable alternatives. So that, unfortunately, where we exist right now is a classic and private road agreement. John said the current fire marshal's interpretation of the fire code is it not in concert, but that locally the only the fire chief can work with the fire marshal's office to clear up issues or challenges that need to be properly addressed. Well, I will. Well, it it actually goes for the them allowing our fire chief to accept it. I in rereading the statutes multiple times here in the last week. It's actually in the statute now that says that you can accept that you can't require, but you can accept if an applicant chooses to accept the sprinkler system. Right. Correct. Statute says we can we can do that. So it doesn't even have to. And in that section <laughs> on the fire code, it does list a sprinkler system as an alternative that's listed in there. But the state of New Hampshire exempted the requirements for sprinklers in regulation that says. That you cannot require them for residential purposes, but you can deny the building permit because they don't have adequate access to 
you can approve the permit if they added a sprinkler. That's the interpretation of the state fire. Right. Yeah. And yes, Steve. Yes, thank you. Um, a few years ago, I discussed this matter with the fire chief and um, inconveniently enough, the fire code is proprietary information. So the only way to get uh, a copy of that code uh, was to talk with the fire chief and I do have it somewhere. I will get it to the select board. It's pretty plain language and does talk about 20 feet for fire access. Keep in mind, this is for year round uh, purposes. There could be snow in the way and we talked about now, uh, trucks, obviously, fire trucks are trucks and they need a little more space than the average car. So uh, I will get a copy of that to either the town administrator or Andy to uh, and please share that with the rest of the board when this comes to the select board. Thanks. I think one other piece that. Um, just from the standpoint of knowing this area so well, when you look at access for the event of fire services, they have close proximity to the water. So when you look at being able to actually respond and set up a pump, you have very good access there. They have access on Lindsay Point Road where the, with the, pro, the only exception that I would think would be a challenge on it would be potentially the springtime. But I can tell you, Steve Lindsay was the guy that constructed that road, who was also the owner of Barrington Sand and Gravel. And would bet that it's pretty safe to say that that road is overbuilt, if anything, up through there. He used to be the road agent, too. Yeah, and he was the road agent. I, and, and the other piece about that is, is if you were going to get fire trucks up in there, not only are they going to use Lindsay Point, but they're going to use Cottage Lane because it abuts the whole property all the way around. It actually goes through this property. Yes. Yeah, Cottage Lane is an easement over this piece of property. OK, so it seems like it's it's clear that. This issue. Of 20 feet wide is one that the state fire marshal. Is enforcing. So now this is going to be. As a board, what do we want to say? About this? I mean, to me, we have a, it's kind of a problem because our we could just do diligence, look at our town regulations, which say one thing, and we have a new interpretation, which says something else. So yeah, it appears we used to interpret that with the two foot shoulders, you could have the road sixteen feet wide and it met the requirement. For and it's in our regulation. Yeah, and it wasn't just well, it, but our regulations do say twenty feet. The regulations are separate than the class six and private road agreement policy. So the select board um, through state statute has the authority to issue building permit for class six and private roads in access, specifically under the scope of access. So separate than the town's regulations, the select board has a separate policy, the class six and private road agreement policy, which sets out standards for what that access should look like. And so the Rural, what's the standard? Geometric design for low volume road. That's 16 foot travel by two foot shoulder. That's what the select board used as part of their, which is also in the regulations, but it they're separate. We have 18 foot usage up too. So. And it is a central. Uh, he has frontage. He has frontage on the road. So if he created a driveway going in, we make it so you cannot exceed 18 feet at the radius, and the driveway can't be more than 14 feet, and he can make a driveway go in the same distance. As now they're saying he's got to make 20 foot. So the it's it's going to the same house. I mean, it's there's a lot of things that just don't fit to make any sense. So if this determines that all driveways are now fire lanes and they got to meet fire lanes, we have to redo our whole driveway regulations because uh, we're not allowed to have a driveway. Okay, I, I think that's a bridge too far. This is a private road. It accesses but a he, dozen or more <clears throat> properties. But he also has access on Young Road. He doesn't have to take access off Lindsay Point. It it's it's actually better that he does for the town's benefit because if you know that knoll coming over there, it's a blind it's a blind knoll and it would be it's less of a safety hazard not only for him but for the town 
to, to do that. So we're going to require him to go to an extreme level to do it, to do something that benefits the town. Because it minimizes the curb cut on the town road. Right. Yeah. No, oh, I, I understand that. <laughs> So what are we gonna what are we gonna tell me? Andy <laughs> and his co-conspirators. <laughs> can can I make a simple recommendation? If you Please. do similar to what you've done on the other ones, just uh, make the recommendation that you support the road agent and uh, fire chiefs. Um, recommendations and move it forward like you did well, all the other I know, that, the select that's kind of where I was going and unless somebody objected then I would think that we would go with the standard letter and say you know but we support the the position of the fire chief and the road agent with respect to <clears throat> improvements on the road and leave it at that I mean the select board's going to decide what's going to select uh, what it's going to decide anyway right. so they're going to <laughs> actually we're punting the ball punting back down, to right. the select board. <laughs> it's their policy anyway right the 16th. correct it is their policy right so it's going to be another long drawn out conversation yeah uh, <laughs> ultimately the select board has got to deal with this issue period I mean, it's, it, it, this is the first case where yeah not only this one now the one going forward yeah other ones going forward <laughs> Going to have to figure out from a policy standpoint where we're going. Right. Who is this agreement, this policy agreement with? Between the town and the property owner. And the, and the primary purpose is there's a release that. Oh, that's, that's one of those forms they sign. Yeah, okay, that's right. I remember that. that oh, okay. Well, it's included in the sign. Yeah. yeah. It's, an it's an indemnification that they won't hold the town liable if it's the delaying service. Yeah, there's that whole right. There's that whole private road agreement that they signed saying, yeah, we're not going to hold. Yeah, if you if you can't get your ambulance down to save me when I have a heart attack, I'm not going to hold the town. Up. And that's required under 67441. That whole and there's, there's communities across the state that will not issue a building permit on a class six road. And it's um, Barrington historically has created a lot of problems by issuing building permits on class six road that are substandard. And we continue to, Swain Road is probably the best example of a town road that, that's a class six road. There's houses all the way through there, and it is, it is tremendously substandard. It's yep. challenging to pass for right. season every single year. And so the, the class six and private road agreement through 670, 674.41 allows, gives the select board the authority to set access requirements, road improvements, in order to issue the building permit for the Collective goal of incremental improvements to access to. Which, but the other side of that is Berry River Long Shores, which is way substandard, even still to those regulations, but it's far superior than it was 15 years ago when this got right. done because the roads got wider, it's better maintenance. So there's a point to where it's actually helping right. too. On <laughs> other, so it's not a, a lost situation. There's a lot of times it's gain, even yeah, if you absolutely. don't have that. All right. And, and a perfect example of a town road is Pierce Road. It is a town road. It does not meet a 20 foot standard or anywhere near it because the bridge, the 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 granite bridge that you cross or culvert, if you want to call it that, I don't even think you've got 15 feet in that, on that. That would it would be a that would be a you'd be you'd be itching to the edge of the concrete the granite. To say you even had to another one that right. had a lot of issues in the past, and that's the town. So this board can do the right thing and say, "Hey, we we support the fire uh, chief and road agent, and let the select board do whatever thing it might do." Let's. I think that's a proper thing coming from this. Board. Yeah, I knew I had it right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, buddy. Um, typical government. <laughs> one piece, measurements and whatnot. If we're going to talk about these, these people say with their property and widening the road, the road isn't going to be widened just to the end of their property. It's, the road, it's going to be widened, it's going to widen the entire, like, no, no just to their no. driveway. Just, yeah. 
Just the driveway. Yeah. Right. Because, yeah, up to the point with the building permit. Now, if we could get our select board ex officio member to do something to his house, then we can get practically the whole road up. But now it doesn't work that way because it's already in a built structure. That's not yeah, how that. We just need you to build another. Yeah. Or yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't have enough land for that. A lot of municipalities actually allow a turnoff. I do it as well for white. Yes. Right. Yeah. A, a turnoff. Because there's a real reason for this, right? Is you don't want to go towards a mile in and have two trucks meet and then have to back up towards a mile in order to put the other vehicle out, right? So, I mean, in the spirit of the law, the law is that. Want to be able to get the vehicles in and out, and where we are, and it's a straight shot, 230 feet from the roof. You can see a vehicle, an emergency vehicle coming out. The vehicle isn't going to turn. In terms of, you know, where it could probably be in your policy, right? There are a lot of roads in town, and which are being built on today, right, that do not meet the 20 feet wide with people with children. It may way never way. because it would require a lot of work. It's not on a big So it's going to be approximately three feet down. Two hundred and thirty feet. Two hundred and thirty feet. It's a straight shot. See clearly down. So, oh. so the map here, just so you folks are aware, is not completely. It's not drawn out as it is there because there's actually they built the bottom section of the road to be about twenty-five feet wide, where cars pull in off the road. That way. Two vehicles could easily pass and not have a concern down at the bottom. That's where the, where the well, I'm sorry, what? Where the turn on to Young Road is. So it is extra wide in that area. It narrows down, which was built out when they did the road, per my conversation with the Lenzies. It was done intentionally to keep traffic at a lower volume, and it was presented that way. And then it widens out up at the very top of the hill, up past where the building lot is or where the building is located up where you see the 111 feet, it widens out to where you could get four vehicles abreast in that upper section. And then it bears to the right to Turtle Lane and it continues on down the hill, which is Lindsay Point. But you can actually turn a vehicle around easily at the top of the hill there, or two. The access is, is has to get down Lindsay Road, Lindsay Point Road, it doesn't have to get into that driveway. It's from how to make it road, to the driveway of the house. From the driveway of the house, which is 230 feet out to Young Road. That's what they're talking about. And he, and he is correct that at probably roughly 200 feet or uh, 180 feet or somewhere in that vicinity, 150 feet, there's a telephone pole with a guy wire that stretches down toward the road. And if, if you've got five feet, you could. Probably be on the other side of the. Uh, that at that point he'd be coming right up through his property and if i were him, i'd i wouldn't i would put it in right down at the entrance and then i wouldn't have to widen anything yeah because it comes in it's all lawn coming up there on the left hand side and if they do like andy says it what driveway from here and that's legal <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> do we want to do the standard <laughs> letter recommend open the select <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, do I hear a motion and it should include that because we don't have a draft for the end, that it will be reviewed <laughs> by the chair. I no comment because uh, yeah, the RSA is written it says the select board shall make a decision about issuing the permit and the comment from the panel. So, right.
want to he, uh, he just referenced the fire chief. He referenced the fire chief, and then he said uh, that the requirement will be that the driveway entrance be pitched back from the road to prevent any added runoff and impact on Lindsay Point Road. After all construction complete, any incidental damage should be repaired. At the street. It is strongly uh, urged that the property owner join the road association to contribute to the And uh, buddy, did he add on there that the letter be reviewed by the chair prior to being signed? Yeah, I can read it. Okay, so I hear second. Second. All right, so motion made by Buddy Hackett, second by Andy Knapp. Have a roll call vote. All right. Uh, okay, Buddy Hackett. Hackett off. Okay. And Andrew Andy M I. Okay. And Ron Allen. Allen I. Andrew Nair. Aye. And Steve Diamond. Diamond I. Jeff Graham. So motion carried. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Time. Okay. On to the So we said that we were going to start discussing zoning, zoning ordinance, site plan changes. The focus of this meeting was going to be on changes to the zoning ordinance because there is a fine, a fine schedule by which those things have to be submitted. So we've got to. I need to Let's start with zoning changes. What we want. If you might go on, let me start on the list on this go down. So I, I have zoning changes and um, by the way, I'm writing the list so I don't get it because while wandering around in state statutes, I tripped over some stuff. Make it that zoning. And it's new stuff that got added into the section on voting permits, which nothing you know something about. It must be nice to be retired and have all this time to do this. I don't have a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, John. So so I have this list here, zoning changes. Yeah. So right. uh, the lots, if you I included the tax maps in your packages so that you could see them. But the lots um, 22057 was the subdivision that was done on Tolkien Road that abutted 25. So that whole section was all zone regional. Hold on. I, uh, I included the zoning map and then also the tax map. So if you have pages stick together, John, we need a minute to find the map. I was just letting you know this. It's going to be two maps. All right. I found it. Here, it's right here. I got it. I got it. Everybody got it up? Yep, we got the uh, here. Okay, so 22057 was the conservation subdivision that went along Tolan Road, and the open space butts right up to 25. So, those would be the lots 22057, and then also lots 22057.1 to 57.17, um, which are already commercial or open space and could not be developed or should not be developed as a commercial thing. And I highlighted the whole thing in yellow. Showing the whole layout and it goes on the next map. All right, that's a conservation conservation sub subdivision. Right. 
on Tolan Road. But it abuts 125. So it's and right now it's on it's part of the deep the, the open space. Yeah. The, all of this right now. The whole lot is that when you look on that zone map. Because it's within 500 feet of 125. Yeah, so that whole section before the subdivision was zoned recently. Now that it's for a residential purpose, should go back to general residential and start to be in left as regional commercial, especially where they're like one acre um, conservation subdivision lots. So. If they went to one acre conservation subdivision lots, shouldn't that that point protect the rest of it to from development? Well, it's still regional commercial by our regulations. Why would we leave it regional commercial if it's going to be used as a residential purpose? It was just trying to clean it all up to make it. You know, what happened is during a zoning board meeting, it was referenced that that area was zoned regional commercial. So if someone came in that lot and it met the regional was hands tied to something because it met all our regulations. And the intent is now those are all residential lots. Why would you want a business in there, especially with our protective covenants? Now you'd be forcing the landowners in there to have a lawsuit against the neighbor for not following protective covenants because the town can't enforce our protective covenants. We can only enforce our regulations. And that was the reason why I brought it forward to make that change in that area. What? What is this other one that shows? You go to map 23, the bottom section of all that stuff that lays out. It's all part of the same wall. Oh, that's the different. other side. Yeah, that's, yeah. So right now we're on map 220 and 223. There's other ones coming through. I just want to address these. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that one there. The next one on tax map 226. That's the subdivision part of the town hall subdivision. And so what I did was I, I recommended change like 50 feet along, leave it regional commercial because you got to do any residential stuff. And right now it's all shown as one lot of record. But as soon as the curb cut gets approved in the alteration of terrain, that residential subdivision go in. They have been approved, so the same reason when someone buys one of those residential lots, you don't want to have it to where they could be coming in saying, I want to do a commercial thing there. And you kind of have your hands tied. You're talking about the Bell Zones. Bell Zones, correct. Yeah. So I, so we're looking at tech. one at a time. You need to slow down. Okay. Uh, all right, so we go to the back one. We can take <coughs> Go back, but yes. So we've got the the foul zone. It has the commercial lots out front. Someday, maybe not this decade, but there's supposed to be a town hall and C1, and then uh, then you get to develop. Oh, I mean that car. Okay. And you actually have application in. two of those other commercial yeah, lots in front of you the next down uh, next meeting too. What is those other two commercial lots? They're, oh yeah, okay. They're going to be coming. So, in, so you. So right now, the 500 feet, John. Where? It's roughly along the lines of that. If you look at the Fell Zone subdivision. Yeah. It's roughly the back line of those commercial lots where I drew the yellow thing. Okay. So there isn't a problem with this. Well, right now that whole thing, even those residential homes on that. Right, because they had to go get a variance to put the homes. In. No, right. the homes are born in 500 feet back from the road, so you're allowed to have residential okay. get 500 back off. Then what's the problem with this? Those residential lots, when they get developed by Joe, yeah. the underlying land is still zoned regional commercial. So when someone buys one of them lots, we don't want them to put a business on one of those residential lots. Doesn't regional commercial extend back 500 feet? No, it's the whole lot. The whole lot. The whole if, lot's in regional If the lot is within 500 feet. You can't do residential purposes within 500 feet of right. 25, but the whole lot is zone regional commercial at this point. Which meant when they any one the, of those lots, they could potentially build all com for commercial purposes. And they'd come in front of you, and you would have to apply your regional commercial regulations. That's where the problem is. Something's not making sense. If, if regional commercial only extends back 500 No, it doesn't. The regional commercial is the whole lot. 
you cannot do a residential use within 500 feet, but outside the 500 feet, you can do residential, even if it's zone regional commercial. But you can still do a business on the whole lot, which is. If we define regional commercial, though, by by distance, it's not. Look on your zoning map. That's the point I'm trying to make. That's why I supplied the zoning map too. It's the whole lot. If the lot touches 25, they zone the whole lot regional commercial. And that's how it's zoned right now. But John, to Jeff's point, what rather than do a lot by lot, why don't we just do 500 foot? Because what happens is if you get outside that 500 feet, which is the one I'm going to bring up um, farther down, that is, you would be saying we, we don't want commercial development if it's more than 500 feet off 125. So what I'm bringing forward, I actually talked to Steve Lindsay because this is in general residential, even though everybody always thought it was regional commercial. So I did talk to him and he said that he always thought it was supposed to be regional commercial and I'm recommending moving to individual commercial instead of general residential after talking to him because he would like to do that because that's what he thought it was. Well, Bumford Road is within regional commercial, right? Well, yeah, but not his pit. His pit is outside of it. It is actually. The pit isn't. The two way tactical is regional commercial, and then anything behind that. So his pit, I like it out. You can go to your next map that I got drawn out, which was uh, tax map um, 251. Okay. That has kind of around where that pond is. Yeah. Is. Uh, by Winkley Pond. That's the whole thing with the gravel. Everything always anticipated some kind of commercial development um, to go in there. But it's not zoned to have it in, so he wouldn't be allowed to do it the way it's zoned right now. Would be. So the pit is totally within general residence. The whole pit is correct. And he thought it was regional commercial, and everybody else in town did. There's actually been some planning board members that have talked to him in the past about trying to do some type of commercial. Did he get a variance to do that? Did he need one? Did he need it? What he's doing is. Gravel pit was in existing before we had any zoning regulations. Right. Going. Okay. So was like he was green five. Basically, right. yeah. But anyways, his gravel pit, once it gets used up, would make a great commercial park for the town to broaden our tax bases instead of putting a mobile home park out okay. there. So I can uh, tell you they talked about doing the same thing over in Newmarket. They got a pit area over there. Right. So, so the zoning regional commercial would make the most sense for the town, and it makes the most sense for. Steve Lindsay and I went and talked to him because I didn't want to propose something behind his back. And he looked at it and I showed him the regulations and he basically told me I always thought it was. I prefer it to be that. <laughs> All right. So I think we semi understand what you're saying here, John. You want to convert. But once that we know we're going to have houses, I want to convert to general residential so that it won't okay. be. Okay. All right. So, backing up here, um, talk about what you're going to do later. So, you want to change. What we're talking about is three locations total. One for one. The subdivision built right. Mm -hmm. The other one is the one next to the town hall, which yeah. has condition has approval, approval from the conservation And I want to take all the residential section of that and put it in the residential. Just keep that commercial for the lots that are up front. Okay. And then I want to put Lindsay's pit into regional commercial and take it out of the general residential because. It would be in the town's interest and his interest to be able to have a commercial base there to broaden our tax basis. This is the portion you have outlined in that piece of wood. Yeah, that 50 foot along the front because you can't do residential within that 50 feet with four commercial lots by the Which in turn is the, the deal they had to do with the town of. Those lots to come out. Um, yes, yes, 251 is Lindsay's pit. There's two lots that is, and then the other one we're talking about is 223 on lot 26. That's the one that's been approved, but it hasn't been built out yet. And I included the subdivision so you can see that how the subdivision was done. So I want to keep the commercial lots in regional commercial and take all the residential lots and put them in general residential. So that you won't have conflicting uses beside each other. I, I see a potential problem if we don't take away the conflicting uses. So when we talk about those, those two, we're talking about 
keeping up commercial sound where we you know, no all of that yeah. i think is set up that's, that's in a good location for what it is and how the use is done all right let's walk through the proposals one at a time so change 220-7 Which includes that, which is the base. actually goes. Which, because of the way they built out the build on anyway. The open space, but, right? The open space can't be built on, but all these residential lots. I suppose even if it wants to be on the general the open space is regional commercial, it doesn't matter because it can't be developed in any way. So I suppose you could forget about that, but all them residential lots along Toll End Road, you don't want someone to say, okay, I can put a business on Toll End Road in this residential lot where you guys have your hands tied that you would have to leave it after the regional commercial stuff, which allows a lot of commercial stuff, but the general residential doesn't. Okay. I, I'd have a problem with developing. 57 itself, the open space it can't be developed because that was, yes, that's it was part of the development. It can't right. be developed, it's, it can't be developed. Never. So it's so you could leave it that can't be commercial, right. but, but what he's saying is all these other lots are still right. technically classified as regional commercial. Right. So, you could, yes, so I could see we could do that now. If we and then over on 223, you're saying. And we're going to take everything in uh, zone development, turn that into general residence. Except for the 500 feet in the front, which is those four up more. Right, right. That's, like I said, it, with the exception of the commercial properties right alongside 125. And I couldn't define them as lots like the subdivision plan because those lots don't exist as separate lots because he hasn't got final approval. That's the reason they do the 500 foot. If you look on the tax map, tax map shows it as one big lot. And until he gets final approval, you don't have that smaller lot. All right. So we're, okay, let's look so at what want. the regulations say. I have to come to a consensus of what you want to get forward so you can vote on it. Well, all right. So what specifically in the zoning lawyers do you want to change, John, to affect those changes? Want to change those areas with residential to be developed into general residential instead of regional commercial? I I, I, I understand I don't that. Want to change the regulations. He wants a lot of uh, redesignation. He doesn't want to change the ordinance. He wants right. I just want to change the map. I just want to change the map. So the zoning map will change. That's all. So zone, he wants a lot by lot redesignation. Changing the zoning map. So the zoning map. Look at that colored zoning map I gave you. Yeah. The lots that show regional commercial, the ones I just okay. Heard. So, what's the approval authority for doing that? Because you have a right to bring forward zoning in different districts. So, you're going to claim this is going to be a regional commercial zone or it's going to be a general residential zone. You're going to make a proposal to change the zoning map. And if the voters vote for it, then the zoning map will change. Okay, we have to vote on the zoning map changes. Correct. Okay. So, that's not going to change. The zoning ordinance itself. No, it changes nothing in the zoning ordinance at all. It's all just right. taking the, those maps, those lots, and putting them in different districts. But it's still at town meeting. It's it still has to go to town meeting because it's probably. Right. It still goes to town. Meeting. Yeah, I'm just, yeah. I'm just saying. What specifically are we going to change? So what I'm hearing is we're going to change the maps. We're going to change. So we're just changing the tax map. These first three that I brought forward is just to change the tax map. Okay. All it's doing. All right, I just want to be clear on what we're changing. All right, so you're. So and, and what's the process for doing it? You're going to that has to come the up. Tax to map would have to have like a little drawing done showing the which ones are going to be each one. So that tax map, I mean, the zoning map will have some changes showing those lots that have changed the way that I just described. And you would have to. Um, well, that's going to be a warrant article, right? No, it's going to well, it's, well, it is. It's going to be a zoning. It's going to be part of your zoning articles that you're bringing forward to change the zoning map. It would be 
it'd be one article with all those lots saying, well, we want to change these, the zoning map to define. And, and, and how do we present that to the voters? To we present a new zoning map. And we're just going to print a map on the ballot or? No, there's going to be a yeah, legal description be sure. that would say this, these lots, the way I got them numbered, which was in this zone are now going to be changed to this it's zone. It's like a warrant article. Well, it, well, technically, it, well, it's, it's part of your, it, it's a yeah. zoning. To your, Just say yes, John. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's, it, it's the same thing. It's the same thing as all your other zoning changes. It's going to be all put on the same ballot and the same meeting at the same time. Okay. So the only language that would change is if you look at section 2.11, which I put, I made a copy for you. Yep. It references the year the tax map was originally done. So that change would have to be. Um, <coughs> what is it? 2.11. 2.11. Yeah, so zoning it, it highlights the year that the zoning map was changed. All right. I would have to change to be this year to make it clean in that section. There's also a section on the bottom of that paragraph that states that it's part of the amendment to the zoning ordinance. It hasn't been attached to the zoning ordinance for many years. So either we got to make the amendment and attach it to the zoning ordinance. That map that says it's the pen. Yeah. Take that little blurb out. Why hasn't it been? I have no clue. I just noticed it wasn't in there when I was starting to bring this stuff. So in. you would have to reproduce this in a, in a eight and a half by 11. Eight. Actually, it was a big no, page like that no, folded in half. Do it that way. It's the door. Really can't supply a map for voting. They listed all the map, the, the map and lot number, right? Not the map. But yeah, but what he's saying is the regulations say that there's an attach an appendix oh, in the book. into the ordinance. But the old the old zoning has it in it, and that's where I got that little copy of that map out of. However, actually got it out of the old regulations. There hasn't been one in the zoning since 2000. And I think yeah, well, it was a, a lot of mistake. We haven't been. No, I should have been. I think it was a mistake. There should have been one in there. I guess the question I was asking is, do you want to? Put a map in the zoning, or do you want to take that little blurb out? Do you want to have an appendix in the back of the zoning, or do you want to take that little blurb out that there is an appendix, or just leave it as the tax map in the town where they come into town and see it? Which you could do it either way. Well, it, it needs, I would say, the zoning ordinance needs to be accessible by all members of the public. Yeah. And uh, seeing as this is, Kind of an adjunct to that zoning ordinance public has to have access so just doing away with it i wasn't doesn't it sit was. right with me it would still be in the town it would still be accessible by the website it's just do you want it to be part of your zoning ordinance okay. as an appendix i understand what you're asking so i'm saying the public's got to have access so there's one or multiple ways that could be done one is on the website Another would be that it gets attached as an appendix as it's staged to the zoning ordinance. You just got to make sure we put it in there. I don't know why it came out from the past. I think it was an oversight. All right. Well, I think it's when they stopped printing. Yeah, when we stopped having books and we started doing the online. printed out copies online. Yeah, but you talk about access for perpetuity. Yeah, after it gets approved, you want to have it so it's. A, Right, available okay. to the public. Okay. So, how is the public going to access this? How do they access it? Right. The town's yeah. website, or they come in and look at the map? Well, well, we're not meeting the requirement in the book right now. The zoning order. The zoning order says it's it's supposed to be an appendix. I know that's not me to take that thing out. But so the question is, do we want to change the zoning order, or do we want to comply with the zoning ordinance? Then when we publish the the new zoning ordinance have that as an appendix as it states it should be. So all of so the printouts would have to be in color. On phone with it. We can make we can put the appendix in to make the compliant. Right. But we can also make the change. We, we can. Change. The question is while we're doing this, seeing as we aren't in compliance, haven't been evidently for years, it calls into question, do we really need to do that? And I, I have to and I think about it, um, where where do I go when I'm looking stuff up? As I have been for weeks now, I go to the, the website and go to the incredibly slow uh, query function and go looking for stuff. 
Right. So I'm thinking where would people normally go if they wanted a copy of this thing? Usually in our office I'm talking. Well, I mean, uh, the website under zoning in the blue, you see zoning there. Well, on the flip side, I find it annoying when this says, you know, says references this map right here and it's not in there. Right. That's what right. I want to do. Either put the map in or take out. That, we're talking about. Should we, should we go I, ahead? I, and it, it, it was in before. I think it still should be. In. I think it's that's the most user friendly way. If you're reading this. And it referenced this. It's nice to have this in there. Now, one of the, the problems is whether the map's going to be of sufficient size to be of use. We're we'll talking about this map. Zoning map. This. Zoning map. Zoning map I got on my wall is probably three feet by four feet. So you can't even have to even be able to. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, if we're talking about it's on the website, if you go in that, you can actually click on the website and read it. Yeah. yeah. So if you go to put them in the books, obviously, I mean, the maximum size that could be is, you know, eight and a half folded. So you you end up being eleven by sixteen. Yeah. I. Planning and zoning, it has the map separately. Right. So I, so I question. Say what I would do is attach a link to where to go find it, so you'd have the your middle eleven, but then you also have like here's the link to go find the document, this document. But the ones that get printed out, like you have it in meeting here, that that link wouldn't serve any purpose. No. What I'm questioning is, I mean, if we make this into an eight and a half by eleven, just so it can get stuck as an into the zoning ordinance. I, I mean, this is of limited use, even at this side. If you make this eight and a half by 11, is it of any use? I wouldn't I, be able to see any of the uh, I, road or markings or. I think 11, uh, 11 by eight and a half, it's encompassed the whole map. It's going to come with the legend. This is, this is yeah, you can put those over here. You have to shrink what you call well, half in order to stick it in there. I think it was right. I don't think it's a big deal to make it fit. It's nice that, that, that well, just take out that little blurb that did we and the time take, time it covers the whole map is what I'm saying. Right. Yes. It covers the whole map. What's that? So it would I'm saying it would fit. Yep. I don't care which direction. Okay, but John brought up the question. So well, we gotta address it. Right. One way or the other. I so have a question. What are the white dots? Is it just... that's where John What was the question? question is teeth. Oh no, no that's it, it was it that that taken out of the old zoning it was in the ring binder right so when we, went, we copied the one from the old the ring binder those were the punch outs that was the ring again and i didn't have the right colored pen to cover them back in <laughs> not some special no no not the double secret probation right. zone <laughs> so that's where the aliens came <laughs> so uh I'm not hard over either way. Ron, he likes to have it. It's not it's not bad to have it just to look at. Uh, Andrew, what do you think? That's fine. I'll go with the blue. Okay, buddy. What do you think? I, I think that if there's a link to it, and it's, it, if we make it available, we don't have to have it available 50 different places. It just has to be available. So if it's in an appendix and it says refer to or whatever, or it can be seen in person at uh, the town office during regular business hours. I'm thinking of it. I, well, putting in a link, you're reading the document online, it's fine, but if you've got it in a book like this, that doesn't do any good. Well, I think if, it, if, it's, if it's on the wall in the office, that's available to the public. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if anything that I've ever done in the past. If I had to get a tax map or whatnot, I had to go to the town hall. Say, can I, can I see tax map number 115 13, whatever? They go in the draw, they take it out, big, big size, and you can look at it like that. If you want a copy of it, if they have the availability to make a bigger copy, which towns don't, they can shrink it down to a, a 11 by 14 or whatever legal size is. That's where these come from. Andy, what do you think? So it's on John's wall. You don't look excited. I, I have one in my office. 
Honestly, I think uh, you put it in the binder, you put a link to get to it, and you've got it accessible in the town. You've created at least three or four avenues for yeah. folks to get it. I was thinking about the rather than which one, how about all of the above? I, how I about, agree. How about if we took the small one, it's it's in there, it would be in a binder, and but we add to that paragraph that said, you know, you the map can be viewed also viewed on the Barrington dot website is available to view at the, the town of Mm -hmm. so you want to change that language no, to 1.1 1. self contained mapping app? Yeah, I see. <laughs> oh, that How does that sound? If we just did all of the above and everybody's more is more. Where to go find it? More is more. more. You okay? More is more. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So I guess that's where we fall on that. I just got to, I, I just want to backtrack here. We talked about. Uh, 22057. I think we all feel comfortable with that. Um, and with 22326, uh, going back you know, 50 feet, we, we want the the uh, <laughs> new development, Felsa's new development behind Town Hall. That should shift over to general residential. 2.1. And I copied out. If you go to the yep. last paragraph, it's on the second page of what I copied. Out. Yep. It talks about um, a zone goes through the middle of a lot. By doing that 50 foot line, it talks about how you apply it. But with this, once this subdivision gets approved, none of those residential lots will be included in it anyway. But a lot split regulations of of a such lot A, together in the small. <coughs> Uses permitted within the smaller part of the lot that are not permitted by your below shall require a conditional use permit. But I, I think that works good because you got the same issue. Um, the lot right beside Irving is that once a yep. house, housing that was done, that part in the front that it actually splits the lot right in half. Okay, so I want up uh, so. I just thought I just thought you might want to see. I think I don't think you got to change that. Okay, so we're all agreeable to the first two, right? Okay, so I, I want to look at our discussion though before we suddenly turn general residential into regional commercial property with respect to Lynch, the the pit. And I think that that's everybody in town, including Lindsay, always thought it was regional commercial, and I noticed. That. Okay, so everybody in town. I didn't know that, so not everybody in town knew that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Significant amount. Of Making generalizations <laughs> like that. Come on, guys. So. Okay, I suppose maybe not so much. <laughs> Why would you not want that old gravel pit? Well, I don't. Commercially. I, I don't know. So we're talking about that's tax map 251, lot 64. It's um two lots sixty four and sixty five. It's um sixty four and sixty five. There's two two smaller lot where he has his garage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sixty four. Oh, that, that's the this property right here. Yes, and the big property, and then the little one. We've got a couple of buildings with garages. It's all part of the gravel. Well, yeah, this this so, one. Right. Right. So it's this. So that actually. Access that properties up for covered. Yeah. That pit still got more. By the way, isn't this this is the same area that that monopole that's given four extensions on? It's supposed to be right that's another lot, but it's right close to. Right you know what? Two A yeah. Tactical got yeah. their proposal. It's a lot yep. behind that. Okay, well, 2A tactical, tactical is the lot 63. Um, let me see, we get that. 2A um, tactical, tactical is, is lot 63. Yeah. The one that that proposal came. Right. And so where's the monopole? Um, is that lot 66, maybe? I thought it was back farther from the road, like 51 or someplace like that. But, but the monopole. Uh, 
might it's it's either it's either fifty here. or fifty one. I think it was one of these lots here that had that poll approved on it. I thought because see Bunkford Road turns and goes down. I think it might be fifty one. Because I thought they were coming off of Bumford when they were. Yeah, I think it is fifty one. I think it is fifty one. I didn't look that up. I didn't think to look that up. I was just looking at the gravel pit area, thinking that. So right now, regional commercial. Where where is it? Right now, if you look on your map, it ends. There's a line drawn, so 63 and 66 is part of regional commercial. And then, because those are the only lots that touch 125. So you uh, can't tell from this. Yeah. And it cuts back in, it okay, looks so like 62, correct. 61, the ones, 60, 59. Yeah, all the ones that touch 125. So when we did this, when we did this zoning thing. So 58 and 59, what are those? Um, or it, just, it looks it looks like fi just 59. So yeah, 59. Yeah. So 58. Um, 60, 61, 62, 63. Yeah, those are all part of that regional commercial now. So 66. when we brought forward the regional commercial, we did anything that touched 25 and 4, no matter how big the lots were. That's how we did it when we brought it forward. Right now, 65 and 64 are general residential because they didn't actually touch one. Right, and, it, and it's and that's the gravel. Right? Correct. Well, 65 is where the trucks. That's his entrance, right? It's still part of the gravel. It's, well, it's yeah, I, yeah, two separate lots of record, but they're all part of the gravel. They're all part of the gravel. Okay. So. <clears throat> I, I will tell you that I I, I mentioned because I just happened to <laughs> go to some planning board meetings in Newmarket because of friends were having their zone. But they were talking about they had the same situation over there with a gravel pit. Only their plan was not to develop it commercially. They were going to uh, the the long term plan that the the town and the pit owner was pursuing was. After they got done with the pit, they were going to do some leveling, smoothing, filling. They were actually going to turn that into some type of uh, multi-family residence units. In there. he could do that even as part of a regional commercial. And if you look at our, if you go to the table of uses, yeah. a multi-family, uh, part of a regional commercial, a general residential, and it's a conditional use permit. So regional commercial. Well, I mean, look at what we have potentially happening here in Village District with this large cluster of condos that are not necessarily town center, but it's the village district. It's the village district, and that was one of the changes you had talked about, and I got it on the list. Yeah. Well, I just you know, are there any uses that if we made that change? That are in general residential that would go away, that would be less desirable. Well, the red the, the residential portion that's allowed um, in the regional commercial, once you get outside the 500 foot setback, would still be allowed even in the regional commercial. Yeah, and, and all cases that need a conditional use permit, right? Or no, number eight, no residential permitted within. Right. So once you get past the 500 feet, it's just permitted, just like it is. It's already 500 feet. But, but if you look on the difference between the regional commercial and the general residential, when you come to like your commercial uses, some of them are straight up not allowed, and some of them need conditional use permits instead of being permitted like they would be. Says permitted note eight says that yeah. 500 feet. Right thing is, so he would get lot 64. Use John, can I lot 64? Is that like 500 feet away from 25? Yes, so he doesn't lose any of the general right. residential rights, right. he gains the commercial rights, right? Which the town wants to broaden our tax base. So, so the limitation wouldn't restrict. Residential. Correct. 
But that's what he already has. That would be no change. Right, but if you look at a lot of your commercial uses under well, the except residential that aren't allowed or you need conditional use permit for a straight up allowed if it become regional commercial. That's where the difference lies. If you see now now the difference the, a potentially positive difference would be that um, multifamily units could be put into that pit area and that's a permit use as long as you're not five point five. Right. Whereas if it's a state general residential that uh, you need a conditional use permit. Need a conditional use permit. Why would you need a conditional use permit? Because it's general residential, and as long as they meet the no. lot size per no, no by our, under uh, under table, table one. Yep. So table one uses. family has. So you'd have to get a conditional use uh, permit. Um, now, right. If you look at the commercial uses, uses like um, kennels, dentist office, mixed use development, hotels, movie theaters. Uh, grocery stores, um, development, self storage, all those are not permitted in general residential, but they're permitted in regional commercial. So if you wanted to get a commercial base, all of a sudden he wouldn't be allowed to do them unless he went to the. Yep, 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 no, no, I, I, and those are, this is a discussion I want to have so we understand. Steve, you kind of dropped out there for a while. Are you, you back? Yes, yes, I'm back. I had a technical glitch, I guess. Um, okay. So I just wanted to point out, could I, I would like to read from uh, our zoning ordinance on regional commercial. It says here, this is under 2.2.4, it says commercial and, industri and industrial development in this district shall be done in accordance with the site design guidelines presented in the master plan that recommend a compact nodal form of development as opposed to strip commercial development, which employs parallel service roads, that'd be frontage roads, my interpretation, uh, whenever possible, as well as building and landscaping design that reflects community standards. This is the relatively rural, relatively fast part of 125 that uh, you know, there's the, the commercial area at the Lee Circle, there's a commercial area of what we call the town center at 9 and 125. This is exactly in between. So I don't know if it necessarily needs to be expanded to include Lindsay's pit. Well, I, I guess my counter to that would be I look at what's across the street, commercial ways across the street. You've got, you know, the bakery. You, you know, now they want to put two-way tactical there on the corner of Bumford Road in front of these properties. Uh, you think about, you know, the uh, other uses that you can have after you've ceased operations in a pit. You know, you've, you, you've now cleared an extremely large area that you're going to have to level. It, there's, there is no, when you... Uh, forest area left there because it just does a big hole in there. It, it seems like it's more conducive. And like I said, with all the development that's across the road, uh, if 2A tactical were approved, you know, we're, we're going to have kind of a cluster of businesses in that particular area. And if you look at how the land has been cleared and what it would take, it's not really useful as forest or agricultural land anymore. Uh, it's more conducive to commercial development. And with one curb cut. And with one curb, well, you've got Bumford Road. Right. So, so with one curb cut. With one curb cut. Uh, so you don't even, going back to your issue that you brought up about the you know parallel road, that's not even needed for development in that area. And remember, if 2A Tactical, if that gets approved, the state's already said they want Bumford Road, that intersection brought up to their codes. So uh, I don't know. This seems like. This is a reasonable idea to, to shift this over. Um, it's what the town property is, which right. is if they mine that and put a commercial thing in there, it'd be the same idea, and that's way close in the same neighborhood too across the street. Right. I was in there the other day. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I asked. He's. Still doing stuff, but he's he's got the requirement for the state. He's got to be four feet above that seasonal high water table. So, like, that's the best way to put it. And last time I saw it, it was in the house. It was higher. Yeah. 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 Oh, there's a potential for doing that. I, I'm surprised to leave where he's at. Everybody yeah, it just seems he like. He wanted a place where there's no one around. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. He's, <laughs> he's pretty. Pretty tucked back in where he is now. I mean, the horses might be a 
be negative. I went and talked to him. When I saw what was going on here, I didn't want to propose something to the planning board on someone else's property without talking to them first to make sure they understood it. I went and saw him. I showed him the cable of uses. So we understood what's allowed now and what would be allowed if it changed. And I said, you don't have to give me an answer now. And he called me back like four or five days later. He says, I always thought it was this anyway. I prefer to have this. So, so when I went and talked to him, he doesn't much like coming back. So I sat at the picnic table with him. And, and I yeah, go ahead. I appreciate your point, Jeff, about um, it being a disturbed site, and that certainly makes sense. I guess um, my broader concern that we don't really have an answer for is uh, sort of the build out analysis that the regional we we're talking about last time <clears throat> that the regional planning commission did around uh, more intensive forms of development. The more that is expanded, sooner or later those sites get built and we end up with a traffic problem. So that's why I was emphasizing the uh, frontage road need. So nodal development is a good start uh, as opposed to just strip development on 125, but ultimately we need to be heading towards parallel access roads, frontage roads that relieve the pressure, give other options away from 125 so you can get where you need to go without relying entirely on the main route. Well, it, it, yeah, it, regardless, uh, look at this property, if it ever gets site development, the planning board would have to approve it. There is another access going out to another road. Um, a province road. Yeah, so right. that would be something that the developer and the planning board would talk about, negotiate as part of a site development, just like you would any other site. That, the only problem with that is that the, the land along province road, there is a wetland area, the stream there. Well, what I was just saying that there's still a negotiation that goes on is a site review thing between the planning board and the applicant. Yeah. Um, so it's not like you do something and all of a sudden you're going to have this. It's still going to meet site review regulations, no matter how it's developed, whether it's. Right. And the town met with the developer. Zoning is more options. Way more commercial options to help broaden that tax base, which a lot of people in this town um, are crying about. We don't have enough to broaden our tax base. And if we got more commercial, then we would, our taxes, well, it's like the taxes are still going to go up, but they won't go up as fast. Now, there's no way taxes will ever go down. Well, the, I guess the things that are attractive to me uh, have to do with the size, the area, it's cleared. You've got access to it. Uh, you get traffic off of 125 into the developed area, <laughs> potentially developed area. Plus, the the state is already requiring, re requesting that they yeah, change, change the Bumford Road entrance. Right, right. and the t and that came before the select board, and the select board provided feedback that if they're going to turn that into a teed intersection, that this, um, in order to do it the way they would need to, it actually would require either an easement over part of the land that 2A Tactical is looking to build, or um, a uh, ownership change, a deed, a deed change. And that was the conversation last night at the select board with them was that um, the select board would want um, ownership of that property since the road would be running. So it's a little different than what you had for a presentation because I looked at it afterwards when they were talking about having to move the pole and stuff. If they moved it farther north and made the intersections a little farther apart, it would go across their property. They wouldn't have to move any poles and it would straighten out the end of Bumford Road, so even a truck would come out square. So it was like a win, win for them and for the right. town. So that's the reason why that concept got brought forward. Well, what would they? It would stay to the north side of the island if they give up some land on that whole thing. And that's why he was talking about an easement or ownership. But it straightened Bumford Road out, so you didn't have that curvy end to where now you got better sight distance looking down the road. You wouldn't have to move the telephone poles. Um, the rock could actually stay because everything was well, put on the northern side. So that's what they talked to the selectmen the, about. The, yeah, the only hasn't... problem for 2A Tactical is, if you remember, that lot is severely drops off severely behind where they're proposing the building. That's where the, the infiltration fund would go, yeah. and everything was going to drain out of the parking lot. So if you move things up, now you're getting them on the precipice as far as where the, the, the northern, that northern entrance that they would we talked about them using is already there that's the northern access coming out 
It's actually not Bunkford Road. It's actually on their property. And the, what they proposed was on the south side of where that rock and stuff was okay. coming out there. So I see what you're saying. Um, there's always pluses or minuses, but I certainly think it does open up other possibilities. There's nothing to say it, it won't end up being a residential development, just like what they're talking about in Newmarket. So I, I don't think the change. For discussion purposes to bring it forward tonight, I think and you guys can decide and, and stuff, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it makes sense. Because it is now. Can't put hotel down there. You can't put a medical clinic down there. It's not allowed. Even worse, you can't put a brewery down there. <laughs> so, Across the street. That's the worst. <laughs> yeah, it's not allowed. Well, then you can propose change to the table of use it. I think. Yeah, and then they'll put a brewery next to your house. <laughs> you know, there, there is a list of things that there's a medical, there's a set spine place right across the street. I mean, yeah. to say we can't have one across the other, I mean, it doesn't make sense. You can't have self storage down there. I mean, there's a whole list of things that are not allowed if we don't change it that seem to me to be good candidates to allow. Oh, yeah, right. They could put dental clinic that could become Barrington's medical center. It opens up a lot of other possibilities. Yeah. Turbo Cam could go in there and create more employment. I don't think we want to restrict more employees. <laughs> All right. It could be Andrew. What do you think? I agree. Okay, buddy. Steve. You're not buying it. No, I'm not buying it. I, right. I think expanding regional commercial there is is too much. All right. I support the idea of making it making it change. Well, Mick, Mr. Hawkins has has made some points about uh, asserting that he has the pulse of the the town. Um, the only process that was officially facilitated that asked what the pulse of the town was was the envision process, and it the main point that people brought up there was rural character. So. Uh, tax base was something that was discussed, but it wasn't the leading thing. Well, and I agree with you, and that's another reason why I think that uh, that area changing that to regional commercial kind of fulfills that vision because we're still, I mean, 125, we talked about it umpteen times now. I mean, 125 is a commercial zone, period. Right. I mean, we all know that. The horse is already out of the barn. There's no rural character on 125. Let's face it. Okay. <laughs> it, it just it's got so Winkley Pond. You know, Winkley Pond. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can. We, we got the dot in the middle. Tractor trailer. The desert. But so Dude, there's not fishing. Uh, this this opens up some some land to do some different things. Keep the development along 125. And keep it out of our neighborhood. <laughs> so, you know, keep the rural character. I mean, we're we're pretty well defined with respect to commercial activities and you know uh, the, the residential and, and more pristine areas. You know, we've got things designated like you know Stonehouse uh, Forest, and you know we've got the the neighborhood residential areas. This kind of keeps everything in the box that we built. And that's why you're not going to see it from 125. Yeah, you're not. I know, but you know, and yes, 125 traffic is always going to be an issue, and we're going to have that no matter what. If you're truly talking about rural character, what you'd really be looking at is your neighborhood residential and your general residential and the lot sizes tied to it, because that would do that would drive one of two things. It would it would mean you're going to have conservation subdivisions with more land in conservation because you've gone to a larger lot size for general residential, or you're going to have houses that are spread out farther apart, which would keep that rural character that we're talking about. Yeah, well, OK, that's another discussion. It, it is, but that's tied to the discussion of rural character, because if you're oh. looking at rural character, that's really where that okay. conversation. Although I, I. 
do not agree that you need to have 10 acre house lots in order to preserve rural turf. So. I didn't say 10 acres. That has been proposed. <laughs> not by me. Okay. The guy smiling in the in the big screen over there is one of them. Uh, <laughs> I think the uh, the absent chair is another. So. Yeah, I have a question for just a little clarification for Steve. And you were mentioning that the difference between <laughs> whether it's general residential or as regards to traffic, how would either way developing it change that traffic? Is 16,000 cars go by there every day. So whether it's commercial building or houses that go in there. <laughs> I didn't understand the concern about the traffic. That's what they, what they comment. Yeah, and, and and to add on to his question would be, if you go in with that much acreage and you go in there and drop, you know, 50 plus homes versus you have a dental center or a veterinary clinic or whatever, how, you know, trips per day, are those going to be significantly different? And, and another well, thing is, that John said is, you know, what are the concerns of the, the town? Envision document says rural, but when, it, when money talks, you know, if we really were going to follow the Envision document, you know, the town hall would be in the town hall center, and it's not because it was cheaper to put it where we put it. I think the tax base, and tax, having tax base and revenue and lower taxes in the town, I think Trump's rural character in most people's mind, I, I or certainly up there. So I don't think, I, I agree with John, I think a tax base, Commercial tax base is very important to the town and the few people here. I hear that way more than than real character. Right. Okay, well I'm saying we laid out a plan which, as I, I pointed out multiple times, seems to be working, which is we're keeping the development down along 125, down in you know intersection nine and 125. And uh, this is not inconsistent with that <laughs> plan. And it keeps businesses out of the rural areas where most of us live. So the town could could use a bit more development. Um, I, I'm, I'm there with you on that. Um, and so we've zoned commercial a, a, a notable amount of the town because we don't want to lose the opportunity to get some more of that development. But the tendency is that sooner or later everything that's zoned a certain way eventually gets developed to that level of intensity so we can say that each little thing doesn't add much but if it all gets developed even to a modest amount to that capacity sooner or later it makes a problem that's kind of a nightmare of traffic which is already what we're heading towards anyway but there are things we can do to make it less bad and, and i uh, i understand that which is why i asked the question that whether you put in, you know, develop that area, they could go in there and put in, you know, multifamily units like what Fowles Homes doing. Oh, those single family homes, you do multifamily units with respect to traffic, or you take that, that site and develop it, maybe, you know, some kind of business or offices or whatever. Uh, the question is on trips per day, are those two gonna be significantly different? Is your your concern has been focused on the traffic with respect to 125, which I'm not sure by not making the change, I don't think you make any significant difference in how much traffic is going to hit there, whether we keep it as general residential and it gets developed for residential uses or it gets developed commercial. So if, if it's not going to have a discernible impact on traffic on 125, which we all agree, it's a it's a problem today, and it's going to be even worse ten years from now. But it you know if it makes no discernible difference, then why not open it up to more possibilities? And going back to what I said before, let's just keep with the plan of let's keep the stuff, the, the commercial type stuff, concentrated about 125, and leave everything back to 125 alone, back in France Road and, and Lindsay Point Road. And, I guess my point is that uh, eventually we need to be heading towards 
reducing the zoning of commercial. Once we have a bit more development done, we should be pairing back some of these areas to make it more strategically focused and to uh, avoid the build out analysis scenario that the Regional Planning Commission was well, talking I, about. But I don't think that we've actually expanded commercial since I've been on the board. No. And we've actually lost some potential commercial property to residential development. Right. right. So we have. So like we've actually lost commercial. The back of Bell's own block. I mean, you know, where the town hall, all of that was. Well, the ones the, I suggested earlier. Yeah, yeah, they were able to be developed commercially, and yet we got residents going on. So, you know, we, we have not been gaining uh, any commercial property. And, and the limit's going to come in, too, once, because we aren't ex haven't been expanding it. And this is kind of a trade-off. If you look at what we're reducing out of, out of the uh, regional commercial by the first two changes on the list, then they equal, more than equal, what it is we're talking about of expanding uh, regional commercial in that particular year. So we're not adding any commercially developed area. And so, so we're we're steady state, and and what's going to happen is, actually, it's not going to be we're going to have to go reduce it. It's going to be all the commercially developable area within the town going to be used up. Prices are going to go through the roof. All we got to do is hold the line, and keep the the amount of acreage we got currently designated with some trade offs like what we're talking about now, and it, we're not going to get overdeveloped because they're just going to run out of land. And realistically, too, I think if you look at the Lee traffic circle and that big developments going behind the gas station, they ain't looking at us for a while. We ain't we ain't the hot spot. Uh, yeah, they already have pre-approved development sites. Yeah, all out behind the gas station. Right? Yeah, I know that uh, Jamie hates hates uh, drug stores and gas stations and all kinds of things, but we ain't exactly you know. All right. So on. Okay, on this particular one, this is the third one on the list. So, um, so five of us have said, yeah, we think this is a good idea. Steve, I, I see you're mulling it over. You're thinking about the points people are making. I mean, so we'll get it prepared. The way this goes is once these changes are drafted up, then we, the board will vote on it. And that becomes part of the Warren article that says the planning board, you know, supports this, they voted. And it could be unanimous, it could be 6-0, 5-1. That vote gets recorded and it's going to be part of the warning. That's exactly Isn't there discussion yes. after it's written up? It is, but 5-1. What's that? Isn't there also going to be, as it is drafted, to be presented to the, to the warning article within the discussion with the board? I approve. Yes, so what will happen at this point, and, and that's why we're having this discussion, does John want to go waste his time, you know, drafting something up that we aren't interested in? So we're having this discussion. So we've now come through three of these. He'll draft up the actual verbiage. Carol's actually going to be. Oh, OK. Well, yeah. someone in the <laughs> in <his> office. <laughs> I don't that, care as long as it's not me, because I'm working on the regular. That's what I'm here for. Uh, <laughs> one more chance to talk about Yes, yes. So, so, oh. You're going to have at least one planning board meeting. We have you're one. Have if you make any substantial changes, you would have to hold a second hearing. Right. And then it still goes to the voters after that. Oh, well, actually. With respect to your question, so do it. we got to publish a public hearing, we get input, we get to discuss it, and then we can make changes if we want to, or we, we still have to vote on it, okay? And then that becomes part of the record. Because you have to hold it as a public hearing, um, other people from the public can come in and give you their opinions you know, before you vote, right? So, yes, we get at least two more one, bites at the app. Two more bites at the app. All right. So there's time. Okay. So how maybe the rest of them can go a little quicker. <laughs> All right. Well, there. Uh, how about if we take a five-minute break? We're going to stretch right. this Let's thing out for on. several more hours. <laughs> no, we're not. The next one, if you look at the table two, Ten, six, two dash. All right. Table two. There was a to add note number L. Wait, oh, there go. All right. So this had to do with the 75 foot setback, Correct. which you wanted to make only applicable on Route 4 and 125. Correct. And there's actually someone going in front of the zoning. 
tomorrow present. All right, so you see note E, e a green bell shall be maintained. So you're not, you don't want to change the, the no, we want, what do you we, want to change? Yeah, we want to add L to it, which would say 40 feet on town roads, and then it would still have 75 on the uh, state roads. So part of that would be, let's say, I'm going to bring this up. Let's say Lindsay's pit gets developed. That whole road there would be reasonable. <coughs> about 75 foot setback from that road. If the echo park thing goes in, they talked about the town property. If that gets developed, would you, if you kept a 50 foot roadway and you kept the building 75 feet back, you're now doing a 200 foot separation on the buildings or something that would never have more traffic than just going into a commercial space. Okay. Which makes no sense. All right. So the footnote, I mean, I, I'm okay with that. We discussed that. Correct. And so you're going to have to trim it off. Well, I just wanted to make sure we had consensus with everybody, and that's what this yeah, was about. This right? last time we're at it. We have an injection. Yeah. Okay. That, is, uh, that looked terribly indecisive visually. Okay. Then, uh, then yeah. So, but you, so you're going to draft up the actual note. Next time, well, Carol. Yes, that's oh, well, that's why we have yeah. Carol here right. tonight. We want to make sure well, every planning and land use is office is going to draft the right. right. All that right, absolutely. Wow, <laughs> you know, Con, I am really trying to keep this going, but some people are not cooperative. <laughs> All right, so to keep it going to the next one, the next one was a change that what's that? Oh, okay, thank right. you for the update. <laughs> Yeah, there's a reason the clock's dead or back. All right, add footnote L to T. Okay, we just discussed that. Uh, okay. So the next one was the one that got brought up because of the conservation subdivision that the site walks in. Okay, that is six point. I skipped one. Six point two point two parent three. That's the last page in our package. Total amount. Oh yes. Uh, yeah, we talked about this. Yep, that's a that's a so, that's a go. Uh, shall not constitute area required. As a, so they met the minimum open the minimum open space would determine how much uplands you need. So if they wanted to add extra wetlands to the open space, they could without a penalty. And that was one of the ones that you guys um, looked at with that conservation subdivision. You were saying, yeah, it makes more sense to give us more open space. We have to have more. All right, let's. Okay, the total amount of open space identified as open water that, that would normally be considered otherwise under shall not constitute more than 50% of the area required. So, why are we changing proposal? Because if they propose, let's say, instead of giving 50 acres of open space, which would be required. Let's say they wanted to give you 75 acres of open space, but out of that 75 acres of open space, they don't have 50% of uplands. So that means that they have to give you 50% of uplands. They'd only be giving you 50 acres of open space and giving you 25 of uplands where you could have gained more open space by your cloud piling the other stuff in there and they still meet their requirements. Say that again. So let's. Because of that requirement that. Um, yeah, but the next sentence is the planning board I, may allow for a smaller or larger percentage if it determines that by doing so, the proposed development would better achieve the objectives specified in section 6.1. Correct. And during that meeting, what someone here made up the thing. We should change that to be required open space instead of proposed. If you don't want to change it, it's fine. This is what. Well, at at this point in time, this is the plan submittal, correct? Correct. So why would we change proposed to report? And so we already we have in the next well, sentence, it says we can decide to make it bigger, smaller. I'm fine if you don't want to change it. It was this board yeah, that oh, said okay. we should change it. I think we, who brought this up? I think Ron did. Okay, Ron, explain this. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I could be wrong. Right? So I remember we, we agreed to it last time. So right, I, but I remember. It's from my mind. But, but someone on the well, board you know, said we should change that. I think if it's gone from Ron's mind, it should be gone from the list. I don't care. <laughs> Any argument? It's up to you. Andy? Guys. No argument. Connor, you no argument. Yeah. Well, the applicant said is there was confusion whether or not a waiver was required. 
Yeah. I think why somebody suggested that you change it to required is so that you don't need Well, then we would need a waiver. Huh? You didn't need a waiver. You didn't need a waiver because the language doesn't require waiver. It just gives right. you discretion. It gives us discretion. Why would we want to put ourselves in a position where we have to do a waiver? No, I think you want no, to. No, no. Come on. No, this is. No, this isn't required that they have to give you 50% yes. of the proposed space. It's 50% of the required, so they could give you All right. extra open space. Does yeah. anybody have objection to scratching this one? No. Okay. Uh, can we Scratch. backtrack one? I missed one on that page. I had the table of uses on it. Wait a minute. I didn't have it on my list. <laughs> what, wait a minute. What? Add footnote L to table two. We already. Yeah, but there was a thing on. Let it eat. Yeah, I see paragraph four of this ordinance. Yeah, that's just a correction. It's yeah. Like yeah. Oh, it yeah. should be. So fun. That's yeah. I missed yeah. it when I was when I made my list. All right. I missed it. So, so everybody, different. look at your table two. He wants the correct paragraph four to paragraph five. Two changes. Anybody object? Two. Nope. Okay. We're good. We got it. I, I, I know. Okay. Fix it. Listen. The planning and use office, they can fix this. I have total confidence. Can we send them sensitivity training? <laughs> okay. The, the next one, the next one, we can keep. I'm trying ahead. to qualify for a job at Turbo. Uh, anyway. Okay. <laughs> I figured it. All right. Add provision to section 7.3. Yeah. This was one we talked about bringing forward, then we oh, thought we should. You know, we should. Oh, so yeah. it's, there's been some conflict. So yeah. if you look on yeah. business, you're only allowed two non-employees and that requires planning board approval. So a new home occupation, I don't want to be in a position we're in now um, to where they could have any number of employees because we're not listing it. Are, uh, okay, so what are you proposing so, for us to do? So the home occupation should only be run by a person that's a, a member of the home. I found some other regulations, so we might want to add that in there as one of the number was one of the um, one of the provisions. Yeah. So and then if you're going to limit the number of employees, you should define what that number is. Now, whether you want them all to be home occupation, you want them all to be members of the residence to work there, or if you want one or if you want two. But I think there should be a number in there because. Like I said, you only can allow two in home business, which so, is plan and board approval. I thought that was the difference between home occupation and home business. If you have a home business. Well, our definition is not clean, so we we're not able to use that. We're a definition of a home occupation, not our definition, but the general definition is the occupant of the home runs a business. But because we have a definition in our zoning, we can't use the general definition. So we would have to put it in our zoning that you're regulating it that it only can be occupants of the home or if they go outside the occupants of the home, how many outside occupants can be part of that? Just to make it so. All right, let me ask the question again because it didn't address the issue I just brought up. How about, so we already have a home business that allows other people right. outside the home to come in no more than two, right. correct? Yeah. All right. Home occupation doesn't specify because I think the assumption was this was conducted by the residents. It was an assumption, and the attorney says we can't use an assumption okay. or a general definition because it's not in All our right. regulation. So, so in that case, what you're saying is, and this is the way I had always thought of it, was that home occupation was just residents. There would be zero outside employees. So we got to put that in writing in the home occupation. Okay. That's the point. So, so what do you want to change? So seven point. 3.8 home occupation shall assist solely solely of an, of occupants of the home legal occupants of the home yeah i think that would make that i mean if that's if that's how you want it to be that it's only occupants of the home we have to put it in there in writing that's the point okay then can the let me ask a question i, I will be practical could the planning and owner's office draft up some work to it correct oh that would be but what I did was kind of say, how many did you want? Now you want, no, we, so it's none. It's zero. That's the clarification I wanted tonight. Zero. zero. None. Okay. Not a. Only by the residents of the property. Solely. Solely. Yeah. Andy wanted solely. Yeah. Oh, that's that's great. Well, because, and here's. That sounds like a thing. 
the only reason I, I say it that way is because somebody could have an address listed. They could just have their address listed as the house and be like, well, I'm a resident of the house. Right. Yeah. So you want, yeah. So we want to say solely by the resident. Yeah. Well, he's got persons residing on the premises. That's, right. That's pretty good. I think. Yeah. Okay. Whatever. That's pretty good. All right. So. Okay. And, and we've got a green. Uh, okay. The so next one was the 9.5.1, parenthesis <coughs> 5. Wait a minute. Okay, so the next two. All right. Uh, 9.5.1. One. That was the one where Tana came up with the idea to add on lots. The town the administrator section. came up with an idea. And you asked if we could put that in writing. So wait, wait a minute. So what page is um, there's actually a copy given to you with that amendment thing put in there. So nine points one would be I don't page, page thirty six of the zoning ordinance. Uh, so I if the board's intention was that it brought the existing prior it's the one that keeps coming up every Correct. once every in a while. Five years. Yeah. Nine five. Then we got a whole new set of board members. Five. This ordinance shall not prohibit the construction of. So we're in the buffer zone. Okay. So what do you want to change the word to? After or on lot that otherwise legally existed. Yeah, so well you got planning board who are then or on lot, which otherwise, yeah, would be that last sentence. That's how it's been applied because that's how I read it. Okay, so but read you read for us, but the sentence will read like if you make your point. This ordinance shall not prohibit the construction of principal and accessory structural structures within the buffer zone on unimproved lots that were approved for subdivision by the planning board or on lots which otherwise illegally existed on or before March 13, 2001. That's where it leads to current. No, after all, you got on lots added. That's going to clarify. That's how I read it. I don't that's think, I think. Oh, so it, you're saying even said, if it wasn't a subdivision. Any lot that was any lot that, that was in existence, all the old yes, 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 get it. Nice. So there is an interpretation that says that or on unimproved lots refer back to subdivision, not every lot. And so John's understanding of the intent and interpretation is that it's that those are two separate things, subdivision by four. Okay, so by me and my two. So you insert on lots after or correct. Okay. Uh, Bunch? Andy? Sure. John? Good. Yeah, but I'm, I'm, Steve? I'm, I'm back on required. Uh, oh, is that, I think you were the one that suggested that before. Yeah, I'm back. And he couldn't even remember. Couldn't why remember. It made any sense. And now he can remember. All right. This well, is so confusing. Let's finish this one for us. Finish this one. Go we'll kill the next one. Oh, or go I backwards. Thought I'm okay with this one. Let's finish this one. Go back in time. We're on a. We passed it by. No, we did not. I asked. He said, a, I don't know. It was and everybody a, else said, I don't know. So we said, all right, from scratch. It was a fleeting moment and clarity came back to me. Yes. Right. I still don't really, hang on. So I, I really don't understand what, so uh, what nine point. Yeah, so what happened, Steve, was that, that the way this read, that people were saying, if you had lots, which uh, existed, but they weren't part of uh, a subdivision, then well, the well lines weren't permitted if, if even though they existed before 2001. So the so word is in, only about well lines. This is not no, about. Nothing to do with it. it's really excuse me. Uh, well, I, 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 but the ordinance itself on wetland buffer says that if a lot was created prior to 2001, then if it wasn't part of a approved subdivision, then this didn't apply. 
which well, that was never. If that it was wasn't intense. approved as part of an unimproved water for right. So right. what that happens is with some lots were created and people would come in to get a building permit and the house would be built. Then they would come back to build the garage afterwards. My interpretation on this is these lots and my predecessors was those lots were not improved at the time of subdivision. So those were unimproved lots. So the buffer didn't apply to them. Now, there's another person's interpretation that says once the house goes on, it's an improved lot. So therefore, if they want to put the garage on with the house, they can. But if they decide to put the garage on a couple of years ago, they can't because, because now they're calling it an improved lot. But that's not how I read this. And that's not how my two predecessors read it. And in 2015, this whole thing came up before and the planning board discussed it and decided to leave it alone because they felt my interpretation was correct. But it's come back up again this year. So it's like, let's clarify it to make it so it doesn't come up again. OK, so uh, I, I guess I, I think once you improve a lot, it's improved. Uh, I did a little search for state law about around what unimproved lot meant, and I, I guess there's not anything meaningful that I could find because I guess uh, it's supposed to be self-evident what unimproved means. You have not but unimproved at the time of the subdivision is what I'm looking at. So if it was unapproved at the time of the subdivision, it doesn't apply to this lot. That's the point. So any. So lot does that mean well, that then if that's true? was one interpretation that, that, that and you can interpret this any number of ways. One interpretation that you, that you, right, but well, so I still have no idea what it means now or would mean once changed. I mean, to me, this should be removed entirely. 9.51% prints these five should be removed because it's in conflict with all the rest of the stuff on wetland buffers. Wetland Not buffers really. should always apply. If you go to 9.51 parentheses one, all those lots that had setbacks are exempt from upper requirements 100%. So if you change this to say any lot that was created, any lot that exists now has buffers that would be in conflict with one. So then you're actually creating a conflict if you change, if you don't apply it that way. So that's the reason why it's been interpreted that way. So that wouldn't be in conflict. Well, personally, my, my position is that there should be 100 foot wet, wetland buffers. So going to 45 would be reasonable. Uh, it's really confusing. There's a lot to it. I, I, I don't even know. It, it, I have trouble following what it says and what it means. And and uh, personally, I think well, the, the uh, meaning, there should the be meaning lots, lots that were when lots were approved under the, the whole thing with the setbacks is you would look at the lot and say, OK, you've got a buildable area and meet those setbacks. Lots that were approved after setbacks when it changed to buffer. They showed the buffer and you showed that you had a buildable area, so the lot was buildable with the buffers. Now, any lots pre-2001 that didn't have buffers, are you going to create those lots to make them non-buildable by adding buffers to them? Because now there's no longer a buildable area, but it was a lot approved for a building lot from the planning board. So that was the reason why the buffer and the setbacks didn't apply um, pre-97, because 97 and 2001 is when you had the setbacks. And when we changed it to buffers from setbacks was because people would build a house right up to the edge of the um, the setback. And then someone would buy the home and they were filling in the wetlands because the house was just 35 feet away. Now, if you read the buffer definition, it says no dredge, no fill. So the fill extensions of the house has to be 50 feet away from the wetlands. So even if someone decided to change something around the house, their, their fill extensions were so far away from those wetlands since they filled a little in the buffer, the wetlands was protected. So the buffer was meant to be a protector. And the other person that goes on at one time tried to come in and put a protector on the protector because of it. it the, the whole thing with the buffer has kind of gotten out of hand, I guess. is if, if so, I mean, the buffers work. There is 100 foot to prime. There's 50 to the jurisdictional. Um, unless it's under, was it 3,000 feet? I have to go back and look. I think it was 3,000 feet. It doesn't apply. So, so it's, John, it's just March, March 2001 is when this part of the ordinance got adopted. Correct. And it says it's effective from that day. So if you had a lot and you had, uh, you know, the setbacks and everything prior to that time, then, in, you know, this just doesn't automatically slap on buffers on land that was previously approved. 
and that was the intent of this reg section when it was written. Well, I guess my position is uh, that sooner or later, all lots, regardless of when they were created, should abide by wetland buffers. Anything well, else is is this prejudicial and, is and inconsistent. And so it doesn't. Well, apply. that that may be the way you feel, but that's not the way. <laughs> the town when they adopted this said it was effective from that date it wasn't retroactive which is what you're talking about you're talking about making it applicable to every lot but that's not yeah. what the town wanted and that's not what the ordinance said and if you you can make a i guess a proposal but uh as it stands right now all we're trying to do is fix the language on 951 uh in order to you know, be consistent with well nine five one and nine five one five to just make sure that understanding that they're consistent. That's a whole nother argument. If you want to say, and I, I got to say, I, I'm not sure you're going to get a fair amount of resistance that buffers will get applied to every lot in town. Especially some. It's also just too long a sentence. There should be a, a period or a comma if, or something. If you want to re, we can rewrite the whole sentence. In my mind, just say. All lots created before two on March 13th, 2001's buffers don't apply. I mean, that could be short and simple, and that would solve all this stuff. I think it's too wordy. I even pulled the old minutes to when the buffers were applied, and the people at the meeting said that it's too wordy. It doesn't make sense. How do you apply this? And the planning board member that spoke up says, well, it's okay if it's wordy, and it's hard to understand as long as we're protecting the buffers. I mean, protecting the wetlands. So... So it was wordy from the beginning. They knew it was wordy from the beginning. So if you really wanted to make it short and simple, just put all lots created before all lots that legally existed on or before March 2000. I mean, March 13th, 2001, the buffer don't apply. That's short, simple, and sweet. Well, you could just just get rid of the middle of the sentence. Say this ordinance shall not prohibit the construction of principal and accessory structures within the um, buffer zone. Or lots that existed on or before March 13th. I think it makes it short, simple, and right to the point. That's at least clearer. I like that. I like yeah, the clarity like of that. It. I can understand it. Okay. Oh, and I think that's part of what it is, is because it can All be right. interpreted multiple different ways. And that's what I was trying to get addressed because it keeps coming up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The planning and land use office has has taken uh, my comment. And uh, so they will work on, I think, will, will the planning and land use office. Uh, Absolutely. Oh, <laughs> see, I, this is just working so well. I like you, Lorraine. Um, <laughs> stop spending our resources. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the planning and land use department is no, a laughing. resource for the uh, for the planning. All right, then we move on. The next one, right, the definition, now. the table of uses for bread and breakfast. Uh, this that was the one that you know, he had brought up that Ron no. was. So that he wanted to address, so I put it on the list, so Andy can tell you what he wants to do on this. Well, <laughs> he, he was supposed to do his homework and bring I, and it I forward. Fully acknowledged, I did not do my homework. Ah, Unlike the yeah. thing in land, he's, I kick, I got hey. you the bus. Should I kick yeah. you now? That, <laughs> go for it. I, I've had the bus backed over me all day today. It's perfectly okay. Wow, well, just a minute. I put in <laughs> forward then. <laughs> I remember what the discussion was. Should you limit the size of a bread and breakfast to where it has to come from side of food ah, over right. straight up allowing it? That's what the discussion was. But I have, you can discuss now how you'd like to word that and put it together because in my, you can come in forward. Uh, if, so part of the discussion was if we change it in definition to where we say um, a maximum of six rooms, we keep it as a bread and breakfast and anything bigger than that, you would have to do it as a hotel or a motel, which would require your planning board approval. And that was what part of the discussion was. Um, so the easiest way to fix it might be in definitions, but that's up to you guys how you want to. I like John's suggestion of putting it in definitions. Did you want to keep put, it? So, what kind of number you would you guys want to bring forward? How many rooms would be a breakfast over making it a hotel or a motel? I, I've stayed in a bed and breakfast that had more than six rooms. Well, he <coughs> showed me a picture of one that had like two hundred rooms. At what point is okay. it no longer a bread and breakfast? Right. Yeah, right. I would point. agree with you. That, then it's that one because a hotel. I mean, right. So something in between. Then it's so we so so let's go between the six and two hundred. Let's find the number. That's the point we're at. 
I honestly be, believe the purpose of a bed and breakfast is it's supposed to be homey, quaint, and easy. It's supposed, to, and when you look at it, it was done a lot of times with farmhouses and old Victorians. Mm -hmm. That was that was the intended focal of that. And and we have a handful okay. of John. I'm a house. I'm at six. Yeah, I, I think six is a reasonable number because you look at a lot of these old farmhouses. Okay, where, where's well, that'd be in the definitions. Where is the table? The table of use is you want to go to page 93. Okay, so somebody kept saying table two. That's no, table of use is table two is the one. That you so if you look at that, it takes like the general residential and neighborhood residential requires a conditional use permit. Or it's straight up allowed in some of your other commercial districts. So if you use Andy's concept of the general residential areas where you're going to have the older farmhouse, where you would have a few bread and breakfasts, so you might want to change that table to the places where you would typically see bread and breakfasts. To be in a residential area. That's where I would think, but it's up to you guys to determine. But do we want a business? You know, even a six room, do we want that in the middle of a neighborhood? Well, see, that's why you might want to go to three and say, okay, we can have it in a neighborhood. It's only got three people there in the big house. I mean, exactly. you're that's about. why you got to come up with a, something that works. You can already it together. conditional. Uh, right now, bread and breakfast, if someone has a house as a residential purpose and they rent a room out, there's nothing restricting it in that zone. Unless you put something in that says, this is. Well, how about this? How about. We already have it that you need a conditional permit for general residential, neighborhood residential, and highway commercial. Seems a little strange that it's a lot in regional commercial. Why don't we just make it change all the CP? So conditional permit, you want to do a bed and breakfast period. That's your choice. You guys can do that. Right? What about parking? They have to provide parking, right? Yeah, right. So, so that's that, going to limit it to some extent. It, it, it is, but that's another reason why it didn't matter what size bed and breakfast. You got to address parking, and so why we want to just come in with a use permit? All zones, and you don't want to define a number of rooms in bed and breakfast. I mean, I didn't bring it up. You guys did. Oh, what's just right. saying? We take it on a case basis. I'm fine with it. Like, well, and here's what I see is like you think about um, like a lake property. If somebody has a larger yep. lake property and they deem it, it's a bed and breakfast. So and, and where you tend to see this is like with uh, um, kind of like the Airbnb market, things like that, where people are buying them yep, up yep. and their affordability. They get a big cross up the road here. The affordability comes because they're using it in that way as yeah. a bed and breakfast. Okay. Or as a, yeah. So if it was in a general residential neighborhood, residential, they'd already have a have to have a use permit. <coughs> so but just <coughs> traditional use permit across the board. In that I'm I'm fine with that. Huh? Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Buddy, Steve. Sure. Okay. Perhaps we should define what temporary basis means, because right now it just says temporary basis is a bed and breakfast for how long people stay. That could be a year, it could be two weeks, it could be any number of amount of time. I don't think it's defined anywhere else. Oh, I guess we'd explore that when they came in for their conditional use. Another reason Good why. Point. <laughs> just require <laughs> CPs across the board, then we can get in. Okay. Okay. So, did uh, Annie and Danny's? Oh, so the next one came up because of the two families that got approved in the village district. So, you have 10,000 square feet of land for each additional dwelling unit. Um, and Felt members of this board have felt that um, that was too much density to be allowed. So uh, I don't know if you want to change it to 20, 30, 40, 80. I don't, you know, you can look at how. Oh, there were some it. members that objected, but there were other members that did not. Correct. But it was one of the things that was requested to be brought up. Okay. 
So whoever thought this was a that good was, idea. It was Andy that wanted to change the density for the. Oh, oh. yep. Yeah. Yeah. Always uh, right here. Always causing trouble. Yeah. yeah. Um, explain yourself, young man. So when you when you look at what's happening um, with our downtown area, we're the, the spirit and intent was that you would end up with you would end up with commercial space on the bottom and then residential space potentially up top yeah, and as the dove development is trying to do now for one small piece of it yes but if you look at it how it's spread out what's happened is is that hasn't happened and what we're ending up with now are townhouse style units that will either be sold as townhouses or apartments which if you focus on Barrington as a bedroom community, it's it's a disruptor. It doesn't actually align with what the what the build out plan or the master plan for Barrington looked like. It wasn't an 80 unit townhouse development that's stuffed into a, a lot because the zoning size allowed for that with with the lower lower density and that's requirements the only district that allows that all the rest of them are different right. and what's going to happen is is they is you build that out the only way it's ever going to change which will take probably 40 plus years is that that building that is put in there will have to burn itself out to the point where the only viable option to make it what you want is to tear it down and rebuild it so you'll end up with less than character um, housing stock as time goes on. In the back door to this, when it was originally proposed for that extra, the town center was supposed to be a business thing, and they said they needed supporting residents in order to build a viable town center. So that's the reason why they can do that. Each additional unit and being in the townhouses coming in the way they're done, I think that 10,000 number needs to change. Like Andy said, but what that means is it's something you guys have to do. I understand what your concerns. I don't see how changing this the 10,000 additional unit, let's say you made it 20,000 each additional units, which condos would be half that big. You'd have 40 have units, units there of as opposed to 80. I, I don't think that's going to fix the problem. What you want is more buildings like the front building there, where you get the commercial along the curb and it's got the two floors of apartments above. That's mixed use. And that's right. straight up right. allowed. In all we the want more now. mixed use, right? right? So if you make this strict, you want fewer condos. In more mixed use. I, I'm even okay with like the condo idea, but if you're going to do condos that are tiered toward a, a rural regional area, you want them to look more like a row house or something of that character that that really aligns with with a downtown feel or a downtown center. We're not actually building in a way that's a that, that may, will make nine and one twenty five attractive center we're not we're not doing anything that really is going to drive people to that area to be like oh this is a great downtown feel it look it's going to look like like a, a a standard construction grade building at the end of it and that's what all these are okay so that would bring you back here architectural standard it's, right it, and there there we go that's where i keep going back to because jamie's brought up similar mm -hmm. issues and when I say, tell me how this is changing the lot size, the square footage is, is going to change that, drive that change. But if, when the real issue, is your real issue, the one you're talking about, the same one that James brought up, is the character, is the architectural nature of the buildings. To, to a degree, I agree with that. The lot size component of it I mean, <coughs> is, where, where I look at there is what happens is, you're starting to really load up those lots because as some of these old places get picked up because of the 10,000 square foot density, 
you're cramming a lot in to those small lots. And, and that was intended. In, in it, it is, but there's, but, we, but there's no, the problem that you're going to run into becomes an infrastructure issue where your wells and your septics are all going to be tight. They're going to be limited. Yeah. But not limiting enough to. Well, from a, still, a it's limited by use. DES's requirement. Right. They can't right. put any more units than what DES will approve. That's right. right. So, it, I mean, that's what's really going to, you know, limit the density is yeah. it, it is the infrastructure, but it, because we don't have a municipal water and sewer system, it means you are going to be restricted by those two requirements. And then that mixed use that you like. Sewage in particular. That, that mixed use that you like. Right. There is no maximum density that's allowed. It's like whatever you can fit that you can get approved from DES, but you've got the commercial underneath. Yeah. With these multifamilies, you don't have the commercial underneath, right. which I think Andy So I think that, yeah, so it just seems like we keep coming back to the real issue is in the lot size. It has to do with what type of structure do we want? And that, that goes back to architectural standards, but every time I'd want to go back to that, it's like, oh, it's too hard. Uh, we should be able to figure this out. I, I really do think so. Another way, Other towns have figured it out. Another way you could look at it, instead of having 10,000, if you did it as, let's say, 40,000 for each additional unit, then they would be more of a financial incentive for them to do the mixed use to where you'd have the commercial on the bottom and the residents on top, because they could get more units that way. Because Right now, they can get more units this way if having a multifamily, and they're not giving you any business infrastructure as a mixed use. Right. By which increasing that sound, number, it would give you that incentive. Right. Which means that sounds which good I, to me. I agree wholeheartedly with what John's saying because if you're trying to drive a downtown, you have to have a reason for people to be there. Otherwise, it is purely a bedroom community that people will pull into, they park. They do their thing and then they get in their car and leave to go do stuff. It, it actually, when you look at like subdivisions as they build out in neighborhoods, it doesn't, it, it's not an inviting way to bring people into closer downtown centers and then push you back and then get you to function and live in that area. If you look at what they're doing now, up and down, if anybody's been by like the old hilltop area and Route 1, they're doing exactly what John's talking about here, where you have the commercial on the bottom and then you have residential driven by it up top. And, it, and what it does is it invites you down into the area, whether it's a bowling alley, a restaurant, a brewery like Ron would want. Uh, you know, the, I've got my plug in you there can for crawl that. crawl upstairs when you're done. Right. <laughs> you take the elevator, you won't even have to crawl. So. Hey, one of my free cars is right home. So, right. <laughs> so, so, but, so that, that 10,000 extra that's in the village district, it's only in the village district. So two bedrooms in all the other districts require 80,000 square feet of extra land to get an extra two down, uh, two bedroom units. Right. So, I mean, there's, there's a, a big increase in density just in that one district that's totally different than all the other districts. The numbers should be bigger. Yeah, good like point. The numbers should be bigger. Which I agree with. I think that would that would help drive it in the direction ultimately we would like to see in that area. There would be a financial incentive to do that mixed use instead of just a multifamily. So. Any disagreement? Maybe. I think I'm there. I think the uh, incentive to go to mixed use. I think you know, well Barrington, but I think. You know, to try to drive mixed use in Barrington Center is not easy. I think you need substantial incentive to make that happen. So I think a 40,000 or 10,000 is a substantial incentive. Well, well, the right now, the mixed use, there's no limit. You can get as much as you can make your septic system. Work. Yeah, I know. But because this multifamily is so easy for them to build, and because of the 10,000. I agree with you, John. I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing exactly. All right. I, I, I'm agreeing with the point you said was incentive to go to mixed use. Which we're trying to make happen. Right. So if right you now, change it to the 40,000, I think their financial incentive would change. I think the economic incentives right now are not good compared to the. So I think you're right. I'm with you. <clears throat> so, 
Hampshire. There's none in Hampshire. Right? Twist, no. That's town center. And they got a bear. Oh, there's, 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 one's behind. They're already approved. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to put six more of them in the yeah. right. instead of putting that business I would buy it into box? Right. Like I don't want to see the rest of those parcels. This right. is just village. This is the only thing that changes just the village I, district. I just don't want to see those other areas in the village district get snatched up and built out like that. It'll it, it will ruin the intent and the character of Barrington. If our plan is to follow our master plan, that absolutely does not meet the intent of our master. But so I, I do too. I think it would be an easy vote. Change into 40 grand would be a massive change. Well, Is that the right place to make the change to get what we want? In the village district? That's the only place it's allowed with that kind of density. Yeah, but it's a planned use development, right? No, mixed use. We, what we want to drive is planned use development. Right? The PUD is only the town center. This is village district. No, PUD is not part of the village district, but that 10,000. But isn't that the, but isn't that what you want? Well, he wants the mix use. The mix right. use is allowed in the village district too. Right. Okay. So, what and what's going to? But but the way we drive it in town center is through PUD. But with the PUD, you would have the option of doing a business over here and a whole bunch of residential over here. Yeah. Okay. yeah. A mixed use, you always have just the thing above, and not. And the reason why Dove came in. So you went and got But a you're talking about, about you don't want to allow something in. Village center that you allow in town center, or the village district that you don't allow in that you allow in town center. But you don't. But the town center lots are sizable enough to to do. And you can do mixed use even in a town center. I mean, you can do that. If you can do the mixed use because that was okay. So the housing units on the Dub project, they got more housing units than what would be allowed through a PUD because they got a variance to the ZBA. Now, the commercial buildings with the residents above, they're doing that as part of their commercial build out because it's straight up allowed as a mixed use. So those extra units they're getting above those commercial are over and above what would be allowed right. as part of the PUD residential stuff because it's still considered commercial. Right. And how the way regulations are written. And as John points out, if you look at the mixed use side of it, to build that out is actually really smart because they're going to get 20 20 housing stock units above that mixed um, commercial, commercial develop the commercial part of that development. So, and that was not held against them as a residential density, but he still had to make septic for it. Yeah, but what's the difference between res the, uh, the that's for the village district? And now let's look at town center. Is that multifamily of the ten thousand town center? I'm looking at fourteen four for town center. Yeah, on residential. Oh yeah, for the yeah, looking at the table. And add actual requirements. Okay. 424. Yes. It says non residential use. It doesn't talk about. The only way you can have residential use in the town the center is through a PUD. Where the village district, you have, let's say, you get to have one residential unit for your first two acres. And then after that, you get eight units for each additional acre. But essentially, aren't you talking about you want to drive the multi-use facilities into the village district in a, as well as the town center? No, well, he wants to drive the multi, I mean, uh, mixed use. Right. Mixed use is still allowed, which would give you your residence your pressure below and the residence above. The mixed use is allowed. Right. So that we, we have regulations that drive mixed use in town center, yeah. right? No. 
it has to be part of a PUD to. Okay, so we use we use the PUD to accomplish the same thing. I'm just saying. No, because you have to have only 25% of it can be a residential use um, as part of the stuff with the PUD. All right. So, and the reason why Dove has so many units is they got a variance from the zoning board because they said they couldn't get enough residential units to make the development financially possible. So they got that's how they got granted that variance. Well, that's deflating because what you just I'm just telling it doesn't you, matter what we put in here. Well, the ZBA is going to decide. Yeah, but, okay, you can do it. but do you, yeah, but if, but would the ZBA say, <laughs> But would the ZBA say yes. you got a five acre lot and you're allowed to put 20 townhouses on it? I don't think they would go that far with it. Well, okay. I'm I'm just saying that what you're talking about, what you want to see in the village district is essentially what we're allowing and promoting in town center. It's just an expansion of town center, essentially. With respect to commercial, we want multi-use. It, it, it's Ish. essentially... Yeah, it's essentially the same thing. But the multi-family is allowed in uh, that and not the other one. I know. If I could get there. The, what I'm saying is that then do we just want to take and then more or less just expand, kind of make town center and village district requirements? We did have that once. It was all the thing and it was called um, the village center or something like that and to try to get that PUD that commercial development with no residential in it it wasn't working so that's when they created the town center separate from the village district where it was all one zone at one time and an so argument came up about, and so you'd be moving it back to the way it was basically. okay so if it, yeah so so if you do what you want to do they already tried that and no what he wants to do is do away the density for mixed use it's totally different than what you're talking I said it wrong. He wants to do away with the density for multi-family, multi which is totally different than combining the two districts and having the same regulation. Even if you combine the district together, which you could do, I think you still need to address that because of the people screaming and hollering about how can you allow those townhouses to be built there? I mean, that's what's brought Andy to bring this thing here up. And that's, and I understand his thing because I'm hearing it all the time. I mean, right. That's one of the biggest complaints that people say when they come in my office. How could you possibly allow us? What's wrong with that board? I mean, I hear it on a regular basis. But you guys followed the regulations that were in place. You had no choice. Now you have a chance to change those regulations. That's the whole idea of this. Well, we, we have been accused of being sick before. Sure. So that is going to stop us. No, yeah, but, but do you want to continue allowing these, these multifamily things like those going through in the rest of the that district? That's... That's where we're at now, and that's. Do you, I guess I, we had to we had to address that so that we can move it forward. To yeah, we can go home, and then you know what you're bringing forward. Because what's going to happen is this is just going to keep the all the, these developers are going to keep coming in because it's it's easy development based on the way it's written, yeah. and it's like well, if you look but at that wouldn't have happened if the ZBA. No, no, it, it, it's a very right. No, no because we're not talking the dub. We're talking the two commercial, the right. two multifamily. Because if you ones. you look at that eighty unit development, if you build eighty units of housing stock here in Barrington, and the and you figure on the low end of real estate prices, they're going to get three hundred thousand. Wait a minute, if you're not talking about the dub, which one are you what? talking about? The one on Route Nine that is behind Urban. Urban. Yeah, the uh, other yeah. side urban in the right. one across from the yeah. middle school. Yeah. Right. That's what this whole density is about, both of those. Right. There's so. that, and then the 20 units across from the middle school. That they're gonna build this out, and really all you're doing is helping the developer make a whole lot of money off of this. And but it's gonna be at the detriment of Barrington as a whole. But Drew, I mean, I view Drew Pond differently than the other one with 80. I think they're a little different. And, 20 isn't quite as far across the bridge. No. The only reason is that lot was smaller. If that lot right. was bigger, you would have had 80 units there. Yeah. Okay. It's the same density. So what what would you want to see in the place of that 80? What would you want? <laughs> he, I, he would like, I, I think what he's trying to say is he'd like to see the mixed use. But now the financial incentive is to do the multifamily. If okay. you made this density change, then the financial right. incentive would be to do the mixed use. All right. So 
that that was my understanding of what you were proposing. And what I'm saying is the way we've accomplished that in the town center to drive multi use. You know, we have regulations that drive that multi use. So, I mean, we don't even have to import. Can we change the regulations in, in the village district that simulates what's happening in the town center that's driving the multi use? Okay, the town center PUD setup has been in place for a dozen years. The dub is the first development that's used it. It hasn't been used by anybody else because it's so hard to work with. And the only reason the dub made it work is because they got a variance. So that PUD requirement in the town center is actually doesn't work. That's the part that doesn't work. Well, actually it did. It took a number of years, but it worked. No, without the ZBA variance, they wouldn't have built that. So you would still have nothing. The only way it works is with a variance. Well, well, let me ask the question a different way. So, if you took uh, the dove development, would that be acceptable to put into where the eighty units? It's not the same because it's a large commercial building with a bunch of apartments above it. Well, and it's got the housing out and behind. the housing out behind. Housing, but I'm saying, would that be acceptable? If you change this to like 40,000 per unit, you'd probably end up with something really similar to that. And I'm trying to think what's what's that 25 units. It would cut the take one quarter of what it is. Yeah, probably yeah. probably 20 to 25. Right. But then their incentive would be if they did a commercial building with it above, they could actually get more units. So now their financial incentive is to do those mixed uses instead of just doing a straight up multifamily. But because the density is so high now, the financial incentive is to do the mix, the multifamily, not the mix use. And I think all you got to do is change that density, and the other stuff will happen because finances drive what people do. All right. Well, I can't get there tonight, and I'll have to think about it. But I know I can't. I don't know what you, you, somebody else talked to. Me. Well, I, I mean, I I think that's the best way. I think clearly there's a financial incentive for multi, you know. Multifamily to Google. We're seeing a lot of that. So, so clearly, the multi, multi. multifamily. Multifamily is right, the one. Right. We're having a lot of that. But so clearly, That's the what's happening now. That right. big it's time. Better financial for the town. Multi use. Multi use. Yeah. So if you made that multifamily a higher density, yeah. I mean a higher um, number, so that it got less density, then their financial incentive would be to do that next year. And I think slowing down the multifamily. The, the town is concerned about that. I think there's nothing wrong with slowing it down. You know, if we go too far, we can always pull back. But clearly, the market right now is saying multifamily economics work very, very well because we have a ton of those coming in. And everybody in town doesn't like it because they condominiumize them afterwards and sell them for 300000 a piece. <laughs> right. And you look at the impact on that from, from um, like, really where it's driven is from the tax end and primarily the school side of it, not to mention the services and you look at the impact of it for police, fire, and then our school impact, that's where you get your drive and your taxes. So we want to be able to, we want to, we want to slow that roll some. Yeah, I think those are starter houses. And when I was younger, I was pro probably more likely to interact with the police for various reasons than I am now. <laughs> age. It has it's, nothing to do with alcohol, I don't think. Yeah, no, you do, <laughs> Mr. Mokakis has, like, yeah, that, yeah. has his hand up. Consent. Citizens and like, possibly that. You want more tax savings in the town. Changing this to 40,000 is going to give you a shot of having some businesses. Well, I'm still going to have the housing, but you're just going to slow down. Well, the housing would be above the businesses, so you would get the business along with the housing, right. not just straight up housing. If, if you look at uh, what's going on across the country, too, you know, there is the way that the economy and the environment are, are working together. There's a lot of more planned communities, even in the centers of cities where yep. they have. Uh, 10 story, 20 story building where they have the first four levels of business and the remainder are, are residents. And then underneath, they don't they don't have parking anymore. What they try to do is get people moving away from having private vehicles and things like that so they can control you know, more use of public transportation. We're kind of outside of, of the city limits type of thing that we're going to do. But I think the same thing is going to have the effect on us where we can generate taxes from both sides and get 
new people moving into town because you're not going to get somebody who's already living, you know, on uh, in some sort of uh, you know two two bedroom whatever home. They're not going to move into one of these two communities. It's going to be other people from out of town coming in. Okay, I just feel like we're missing something here. I if what I'm, I think I'm hearing is that we all think that in those in the village districts we want more mixed use development and less multi-family housing. Is that is that precisely summarize where we're at? I believe that. Yes. yes. Okay. Well. All right. So I, I'm on the same page with that. What I'm I'm struggling with is is whether simply changing that uh, that figure as far as, as the minimum lot size here is going to accomplish that. What it what else is different about the PUD? It, it seems like because the CBA gave variance, there's some break point financially here between the multifamily and the mixed use. But it, I'm still not convinced that just changing that number is going to fix this. Well, let me let me suggest this, Jeff. Um, so you're gonna, you're gonna, you get another two more bites at the apple. Number one, um, I think everyone I I sense a consensus that everyone is in favor of. We're, we can discuss it further. I think we have to pick a number, and you know those forty thousand, well, thirty thousand. That's exactly my point. If we focused in on this one number and say, ah, this will just fix everything, and I don't. We're going to write it up this way, and if we discuss it further and we want to make changes, right. we can. Okay. Yeah, I'm good. We probably. Uh, yeah. So we're all on the same page. We want more multi-use, fewer multi-family whomever we can work on. So. I mean, you could take it to the extreme and say it's going to be 80,000 like all the other districts, I mean, which really changes it. Well, do you want a number? Uh, you go that far. Now you're down to what, 12 years? All right, who's going to work on even. change that same situation? Well, have we given them a sense of where we want the number to be? 40. 12. 40? I say 30. 40. 40. So that's increasing the tent <laughs> hearing. Okay. I think 40 is enough. Yeah. 40, yeah. I, I hear a consensus for 40. Right up that way. You're hearing a majority. Okay, so we're up to yeah, nine yeah, and I don't hear anybody else. We, 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 we were, I'm, I'm good with 40. Okay. We have consensus. We have a, we have a no, majority. I tried to address all the <laughs> Okay, so we've got to the end of this list. There's another list. All okay. right. Yeah. Okay. So I, I don't know. I think we're all getting tired. Uh, unless people want to continue on. I got. I still want to go back to that one we talked about. The kind of brushed over. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Required versus proposed. Yeah. I think. Yes, I think proposed. Suck it. Drives. Drives under. I think it. If if I'm gonna give you more, if I'm if I'm gonna meet the required, and it's ten acres. And I'm going to propose more. I'm a, now I require 12 acres. I'm not going to do that. And it, I, number one, if we can do it, yes, we the same thing. Now we require more review for approval. More time on our, and I'm going to ask for more So I think having that language in there drives undesired actions. Here's the wrong here's, direction. Here's my, my problem with changing the word. Everything at this point. We got through the proposed development. This is all proposed at this point. So it seems like the language, the wording is appropriate for where you are. No, no, this is this is a requirement for 50% open space. So that's a requirement. So the question is about elsewhere. No, 50% is the requirement. Yes. So the question is if I'm going to propose more than the required. Is that going to make? Is that going to put me in an undesirable position? And the answer right now is yes. So am I going to do it? No. So this this language drives, you know, undesirable results. It, it encourages the de developer to go in ways we don't want them to go. We want them to go in the right direction. Give us extra open spaces, even if it's not extra up. Yeah, I'm going to give you extra space. But if I give you extra space and that requires more uplands that I don't have, I'm not going to get it. So it, it puts us in a. It, it drives. It drives the developers to go in exactly the opposite direction we want them to go. Some guys will come in and ask, like the last one, but a lot of people will just say, I met your requirements and I'm not yeah. going to copy. Why am I going to? It's going to require a board review and approval. 
I'm not going to do it. It just it's, it's it's a step. You want as clean as possible application before with no discussion, no waivers, no nothing. So I think to me, this is a completely logical. Makes all the sense in the world and to not do it is, is counterproductive to what we're trying to accomplish. So you're saying leave it as proposed. No, you want, uh, you want it to stay required. You want it to stay it, to go. This, just like the way John's written it up, mm -hmm. that's the way it should be, in my opinion. I wrote in what you said. I thought I mean, that's probably why I think that's why he's so bit. passionate yeah. about it. Because <laughs> <laughs> I had marked that page in my book when you were talking. That's why I knew I had to go look at it. I think we should have regulations to drive results we want. And required makes it more likely we can get results we want. The requirement is it shall not constitute more than 50%. Okay, that is the requirement of the area proposed is open space. In other words, if I if it's, if I was full of open space, it requires more uplands. So therefore I'm not going to propose that. I'm going to go down to the minimum. That's what it drives you to do as a good developer. I, I disagree. It drives you to give less open space. So let's say you're required to have 10 acres <laughs> of um, open space. Yeah, five acres have to be uplands. If I want to give you 15 acres, now I got to give you seven and a half acres of uplands. I don't want to give up that upland. So therefore, I'm not going to give you the 15 acres. That's what this is all about. That's that's. I, I understand. So that's what you're proposing is open space. It says it won't constitute. No, we're talking about what the town's requiring in their regulations. Yeah. So you propose it. It's, it can't be more than 50 percent. You want to give them more. So this is what you, you if can't I be more than 50 percent of the area proposed as an open space. But then the next sentence goes on to say, but you know what? The board can decide to change that. No, 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 no. I'm saying if I propose more, I need more uplands. That shouldn't be the case. I should there should be a base requirement, a requirement. If I give you more than that, it shouldn't require more uplands. The regulations requires five acres of uplands. Now we I want to give you more open space. I have to give you more uplands. That's what they're reading into this. So they're giving you less. That's the point. I don't think making that work change. In fact, it makes it even worse. I think it makes it worse. completely incorrect. Well, <laughs> going back to something you said earlier, you can also be wrong, Mr. Allen. It happens once in a blue moon. Okay. What John said uh, about uh, the way he phrased it in very plain language, I like that. Like you have to have this minimum. That's we'll clear. I understand the it. The regulations like that. say that you have to give a certain percentage of your um, open space depending on the size of your development. That's a, the requirement in 622. Common open space is defined 50% of the total tract. Right. And at least 60%, uh, you know, of the, and it goes on for NRG. So that's. Here requires the amount of uplands. But they might want to give you 75% because they're clustering all the houses together, but they won't give you that if they have to give you more uplands that they don't have. Exactly. That's the, that's, that's that's how that's read. So if they have, let's say they got a 100 acre piece, they have to give you 50 acres and 25 acres of uplands. If they want to give you 75 acres, now you got to get 36 acres of uplands and they don't have that to give. They're not going to propose the land to go into open space. That's, that's the way I read it. That's exactly how it reads. Well, oh. okay, so somebody can draft this up and we can vote on it. That's one word, it's pretty easy to draft. <laughs> we can All vote, right. we can talk about it. Everyone every will have another bite at the end. All right, okay. so that's something that's pretty cool. Uh, I've got to, we got to talk about conditions precedent because as far as the subdivision and, and uh, uh, site plan review regulations, because yeah, basically, we, we got to come to a common understanding because we're setting condition precedents that are tied. We're doing in a duty. I, I went through one of our more recent uh, notices of decision and it says the plans can't be approved until you're done with condition precedents, which aren't that. Yeah, OK. But then one of the condition precedents says you have to have an engineer certify that all the drainage work was done in accordance with the plans. So you're seeing a condition precedent is the engineer certifies the work is done, but at the beginning of the notice of decision, it says 
but we're not going to certify the plans um, until you finish the condition precedents. And you can't do any work until the condition precedents are uh, done. That's a definite problem. Yeah. So uh, let me tell you, I, I've been pulling this apart. It's like a sweater. You pull on that one thread and the whole thing unravels. Uh, we, we've got a lot to talk about, about condition precedents and, and uh, you know, so probably going to have a couple of lengthy sessions dealing with subdivision regulations. I, 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 I'm still working on stuff. I'm trying to gather. I've, I've been getting information from road agents and other people, fire chief. Um, it, it just seems like every turn I find out that you know, I just steps in it. And see it. <laughs> okay, so if there's is there anything else. All right, so uh, the next is actually the uh, yes. site walk. November 2nd. Well, what well, do you think you're going on to, are we? The next, the next <laughs> yeah. time the board gets together is actually the site walks on October 29th. At next 11. Week, uh, and the next regularly scheduled meeting. Okay. Right. Yep. So, so, so we have somebody. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Okay.